Welcome to Tukey Sidebar, a book club for prowlers of the necropolis. I'm David. And I'm Gabe, and I'm currently trapped in Todd Howard's basement. And I'm Capitalissimo, and I'm Todd Howard's mole on the inside. <laughs> I knew it! I knew someone ratted me out. The game was rigged from the start. It was. And we're back again to discuss the Biz Archives issue number six. This is a long-standing series that we've been had an eye on. It's a case of convergent evolution where Tales of the Unreal, we all have some experience reading that and or writing for it. The Unreal Press guys have had this, have this uh, Ned Flanders, Homer Simpson-like relationship with the Biz Archives, a, a collective of other alt dudes that have a similar Weird Tales uh, descendant that they're working on. So we all read it, kind of pretty excited to talk about it. And um, actually, before we get into it, guys, I do want to follow up on one thing from last time really briefly, the Patreon. We, we do have some supporters, so just... Just thank, you very much. That, thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, our stalwart tuggers. We appreciate it. <laughs> we appreciate all, all your all your bucket buckaroos. <laughs> and there is some stuff cooking just from the people that have already uh, contributed. So yeah, sincere thanks to everyone that already has. Uh, hopefully you're able to reach out to me directly if you have any thoughts or questions. If not, um, just message me here or something. But yeah, huge thanks for, for the support. Yeah, we already have our first top tugger. Now, we can't reveal who this top tugger is. All I, all I can say is that three months from now, I look forward to reviewing Zero to One by the magisterial Adonis, that is Peter Thiel, an absolute genius of our time. <laughs> uh, he is an absolute wonderful man, and I would truly, truly appreciate his insight and his bucks. Fifteen yeah. Thiel bucks a month. <laughs> <laughs> hey, his money spread thin, man. It's spread thin. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of grifters to support. Um, a lot of people on watch lists that need that money. Um, but it feels good to get back to form because we had a weird two months or so there. Very topic heavy. Very um, very historical heavy with uh, my confession to being a two parter. So now we're kind of we're we're back in our groove with some some fresh fiction from from some uh, some of our guys, some nuts, <laughs> uh, and the bizarre archives number issue number six. We're going to just go through the whole thing, top to bottom. I, uh, before we dive in, though, did you guys have any thoughts on um, the book as a book? Anything that jumped out to you as like an initial impression for someone that might want to read it? Well, the it? UI design is quite nice. I, I love the fact that we have our own ads for video games. The UI movie. design? Yeah. That is just... the weirdest fucking way to say that, <laughs> to, to talk about a book. <laughs> Todd. Yes, it's a page. It's a page. You you inter you interact with it. It's user interface. The user experience is great. It's very tactile, uh, you know, because it's made of paper. It's uh, yeah. It's it, it's in full color. It's glossy. It doesn't have the title uh, or the number on the fucking spine. Wish it did. Really wish it did. No one does that. Uh, the but, spine uh, is too. Th the spine is too thin. It'd be like a title for ants. I think it's 80 pages. If it's, it's under 80 yeah, pages I, on Amazon, they won't let you. I unfortunately, know. stinks. Yeah, but but I, I hear you. Oh my, this Disney had one more story. I think it's 65 pages here total. It's actually kind of got the, uh, you know, if you read like a gaming magazine like Inquest in the late 90s. Uh, it's really got that kind of vibe to it. And I mean, right down to the fact that it has some like, um, some like PS2 core, uh, video game ads in it. So I love that. Um, yes, I, I completely got that PC gamer or Nintendo power kind of, <laughs> kind of vibe from it in a good yeah, way. Yeah, really absolutely. It has, it has soul to it. It has, it's comfy. It's cozy. Yes, it it speaks to it speaks to a time before Gabe was even born, and when I was when I was but a lad. So, <laughs> well, not that you know of. It gave me strong Amp vibes, actually. Amp magazine, uh, for those familiar, and you know a little bit of unreal. I, I completely unreal. disagree there. Amp is way is way more arty. Amp? Yeah. In terms of the contributors, I think is is more what I'm thinking. Stylistically, they're completely different. Yeah, amp amp is I guess aiming a little bit more for like literary style to some yeah. extent, and um and the visuals have that sort of uh, that Sam Hyde esque look. Whereas yeah, this is more of a '90s retro a little bit, and then 
kind of doing its own thing uh, in, in sort of the weird, weird tales spirit. It's like a, it's like a follow on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it had more of a vaporwave the... feel to it, if I remember correctly. True. Yeah, but something about I don't know the way the the, the way the ring styles fit together. I just I got a really strong amp vibe uh from it in a good way it was like i, I just feel like there's, a, there's another band of guys out there that i haven't crossed paths with yet and uh we go arbo friend of the show arbo guest is featured um yep. who i guess we, we we do know so but uh, yeah somewhere somewhere in the world there's a dungeon of these guys lurking together and i, I want an invite listen we can't all be invited to the gabe wants to go to the, yeah <laughs> david wants to go to the goon dungeon sorry i said <laughs> sorry i said uh <laughs> I said, Gabe, it's just force of habit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, someone makes a weird pseudo-sexual comment. It's got to be it's Gabe. Usually Gabe. Nine times out of ten, you're, you're safe. Listen, I'm not going to let some e-whores steal me of my precious seed. Anything else on general? or you want to? No, nope, I think that in? pretty much covers the concept here. We're looking at we're looking at weird tales with a with a kind of retro vibe in the presentation, and uh, it's a uh, it's a fun one. So. Uh, I, Let's dive in. And yeah, there's this two ads that you mentioned, or three ads technically, and they're good. And just yeah, overall uh the visuals in this were just were just uh just really well done and uh obviously put some a lot of effort into formatting, including imagery and everything. Um the first one we have up, da, 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 the Lovecraft Diet by friend of the show, Arbogast, who has a new novella out. Strongly encourage everyone to check out Heartbreak and Lechery. Yep. Which is which is noir. Uh, Arbo is is one of the hardest working guys in the in the scene for sure. Puts out stuff everywhere. He's like an eighth of this ma- a, a <laughs> <Yes>. magazine <laughs> as well. <laughs> well all, all all I was going to say is that this book rests upon his shoulders. Eighty percent. I would say a good sixty to eighty percent of dissident like EPUB like pulp fiction rests upon Arbogast's shoulders at this point. Yeah, he's in uh, Man's World too. New new edition. All right, but this particular one, let's talk about let's let's just really dig into this weirdo Arbogast. Um, th- this is a flash fiction talking about the strange diet of H.P. Lovecraft, the uh, the diet challenge, and he, and it breaks out individual meals uh, by day, and all of it is factually backed by um, or it's all of it's based on letters from Lovecraft, where he describes his uh, his diet, and it's a very strange diet. I don't know. If, I, I think someone on this uh, on this very pod. Yeah, I gave it. May have I gave it, it a shot. <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> it was difficult. I mean, the thing is that like it, it it's basically he eats too much. Uh, he eats too much uh, sugar when he does eat, and he occasionally just skips meals. <laughs> so it's kind of just like eating like shit before. Uh, before it was, uh, you know, before it was possible to just like buy a buy a case of honey buns at the at the uh, at the Seven Eleven and just eat that. So, yeah, on uh, on on Monday, I'll, I'll read I'll read a, I'll read a couple little excerpts here. It's not super long. I guess I could read the whole thing, but uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so. It, Uh, Monday, spaghetti. Despite having a rather low opinion of Italians, Lovecraft loved their cooking, especially spaghetti. The man from Providence liked his with meat and tomato sauce and covered in a mountain of grated Parmesan cheese. Mangia bene. And that's fine. That was, it was a, it was a great start. I did start this on a Monday. So, um. Uh, and, And real quick, the picture to use is a Cthulhu head made out of spaghetti, actually. Yes. Yes. That's a good touch. Um, this man did die of stomach cancer, yeah, for the yes, record. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, the, the challenge comes with a warning. Um, so it's just like, yeah, Monday, spaghetti. Tuesday, baked beans and Frankfurt sausages. Wednesday, steak and french fries. Uh, Thursday, borscht. Uh, Ukrainian borscht with chicken Kiev. Kiev, sorry. Yeah, from chicken his Kiev. Ukrainian, Ukrainian wife. wife. Yeah. I mean, you you know he he was a wife guy with her like if he was alive today he'd be like he'd be like he'd be forced to put the like the, the Ukraine flag in his bio <laughs> she'd be like he'd Lovecraft write a, he'd write a story about how Putin was 
Putin had gone mad. He's gone <laughs> mad with knowledge from beyond. <laughs> <laughs> God. She'd be like, Philip, you better put that damn flag in your bile. But honey, all my right wing friends like Putin. <laughs> Philip? Like, I'm sorry, he, he would have been pussy whipped by his Ukrainian GF. Well, and also, she was actually Jewish. So, that, all the more reason he would be a great fit oh, no. for the, uh, the oh, fed, no. our fed boys. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But essentially, essentially, he just like, uh, he essentially like didn't eat um he 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 drank uh sugar with coffee in it uh in the mornings and ate donuts and uh i my my donut limits like one before i get an upset tum tum so i mm-hmm. i did give it a shot and i was I, I i tapped out after three days to be honest uh just because i i couldn't do the i couldn't do the the breakfasts followed by the heavy dinners so see this is the Blade Runner test, but for like to see if you're white or not. This is this is the foundation. This is the founding stock diet right here. Let me just another another quote. I employ this is in his coffee. I employ, I never employ less than four teaspoons in average cup of coffee of sugar. Blech. It was it, yeah. it was cloying. I, it was very unpleasant. I I drink a fair amount of coffee on a regular basis. I would be. I would have turbo diabetes in one leg <laughs> if I if I consume the amount of sugar that I would need to to maintain his ratio. So and, and don't forget all the Hershey chocolates he ate. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah. preferred Hershey chocolate. Um, and uh, yeah, Saturday. If I had made it to Saturday, I would have just had to eat fucking candy all day, like <laughs> like a monster. Yeah. Yeah, un- it's such a great concept, and he executes it wonderfully. Yeah. It's one of those. It's one of those ideas where you're jealous after the fact. Like, fuck, why didn't I think of that? That's such a, a great little tight concept. Yeah. Um, well, and you know, you've read a bunch of read a bunch of uh, Lovecraft's letters. I don't know where you'd get Lovecraft's letters. I guess there's probably. Uh, I guess there's probably a couple collections of the mouth there. They're, but, they're, uh, there's multiple. Co- they're really good, actually. And, and the, the thing is, his he writes in his personal life very differently than he writes in his fiction. Like he well, purposely puts the pull effect. <laughs> one would hope his like <laughs> random letters to friends weren't <laughs> weren't reading like the music of Eric Zahn. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, it, oh yeah, uh, shout out to shout out to Fritz Lieber. He was he was uh, uh, s- uh, several of the letters that where he talked about food. He was writing to um, uh, Fritz Lieber's wife. Fritz Lieber, uh, excellent, excellent. Uh, uh, early uh early to mid 20th century author who is not not read enough nowadays oh uh, shit guys I'm, a- I'm actually looking at the quotes right now i might be brown because he's on his cheese he mean, literally he says that he's <laughs> he says i'm very particular my cheese i hate rockfort and i dislike intensely cottage cheese it's over it's over yeah cottage cheese bros i don't feel so good <laughs> It's, yeah, it's too pedestrian for him. I, mean, I thought it was like super Anglo. It's a like Quaker. It's the it's the cheapest it's the cheapest kind of thing that you could legitimately call cheese. Yeah, Lovecraft is all about being an aristocrat uh, in his way. Yeah, as he as he, as he inhales sugar and uh, d- doesn't eat the rest of the day. Yeah, listen, if uh, we were up to the Lovecraft diet of immigration, we would although, all be deported. Although, no, he's not that. He's he's not that fancy because, because he says that he only tolerates camembert and brie, and camembert is like the best cheese. Mm-hmm. According to Cole Porter, it's the top. And I would trust Cole Porter's uh, fanciness tastes more than Lovecraft's, to be honest. Really? I think I've ever had yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, Cole Porter versus Love. In terms of being fancy, yeah, I mean, you know, he's yeah. a New Englander. Love, Lovecraft was a neat, yeah. a neat New Englander. Dude. Yeah, no, no, no knocking his, no knocking his, uh, his work, but yeah, Listen, just not love, on that love, topic. People have their own areas of expertise. Listen, Lovecraft was both an aristocratic and the first hipster. Was go no to eat like possible way he was the first hipster. He was a foodie. He he would go eat like whole wall Italian food places. He put in his blog. You, his did you read the same thing I read? He was not a foodie. <laughs> he, he ate spaghetti. He, was, <laughs> he went to ice cream places. He looked for all the hidden ice cream according, gems. According to Gabe, if you eat spaghetti, you're a foodie. 
Uh, no, like he goes into hole in the wall, like immigrant owned local, like a food place. You know, it's like in Texas, the hole in wall Mexican food place is really good. Same thing for the Italians in the eighteen twenties, no, nineteen twenties. <sighs> if I, Mama I mean, there were there. He like didn't leave his house for like a five year period. So yeah, I don't I don't think he was going yeah, he to was immigrant more of, a, more of immigrant a, places. Not not a hipster. Hipsters got to be. Uh, it, it's just. Got to be more outgoing, less uh, agoraphobic. <laughs> like I don't know, it's just like the the opposite. Well, yeah. the obsession with the retro. Like he would wear old school. But I was reading his letters, which by the way, they're really good. You should. Well, I haven't. Like, I he, haven't read his letters, so you know. Like he purposely would wear outdated like cufflinks from like the 1830s from his great grandfather, just because he didn't like the new design of the one that's in the 1930s. Hmm. Well, yeah. that is yeah, he's all that about is the old. that is pretty hipster, but it's also based. So, mm. hmm. what? Is, how is borscht? How is that part of the foundational American nut diet? How is that as That's, a founding stock? It's, it's it's not. What do you mean? Well, I was asking how was how is borscht? I never had borscht. Oh really? Oh yeah. yeah I mean, it's 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 fucking beets, dude. It's fine. Oh. Like, it's, <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Can we move on yeah. from G- Gabe's? <laughs> Things Gabe Gabe, has what is this diff food? Yeah. No, I'm no, also like, not founding <laughs> stock. I'm an Ellis Islander, to be clear. Listen, my so. grandmother ate beets all the time. I hated beets. It's like a weird jelly thing, but it's not soft enough. It's like a potato in terms of texture, but it's so sour. Mm, ruined by hyperpalatability. Tragedy American diet. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Moving on, please. <laughs> we didn't even get to the ice cream. Uh, do you want to read the ice cream? You fucking line? loved ice cream. That was the line. It's not. It's <laughs> <laughs> what else did it say? Oh, he liked coffee ice cream. He preferred yeah. ice cream. Yeah, his favorite was unusual. coffee ice cream, which during his life was only found in New England. A, a, a the death of of local tastes, right? Because <laughs> we can get coffee ice cream wherever now. I, know, um, I, I, can, I can imagine a picture of him. You know the Chud Jack meme where he's like an ice cream like an ice cream dealer. I just imagine a picture. Oh yeah, billions must smile. <laughs> <laughs> you see a little Lovecraft to smile. If he, if he merely had, if he merely had more access to ice cream, we would have had, uh, we w- would have had cosmic comedy or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and more of the humor. <laughs> instead of the Cthulhu mythos, it's the Camulo, uh comedies. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Uh, Gabe, you're on, you're on. On up to bat for the next one, please. Are, are we doing cultist review? Cultist or similar? Are we skipping to? Well, yeah, here so I'll just, do, I'll do just, I'll, I'll I'll handle this because I've actually I have played this game. So there's a there's a quick review from A. Cuthbertson on a Cultist Simulator, and uh, he was playing the 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 video game version of the card game. There is a tabletop version of it too, um, and. Uh, what I I don't really want to like get into what the game is so much as the fact that there's a game review included in this magazine. Um, like mm. it's it's very it's very engagingly written. It is uh, it is a review that he um, goes through a few of the games that he played, the challenges, and the sort of strangeness uh, that can that can occur within the within the confines of the game it, it's it's a well-designed game i recommend anyone check out but um i i appreciate that they included uh something like this which is a very uncommon like i don't know any other um i don't know any other place on you know our side of things where you would find a video game review you know what i mean like yeah, even, it, was, it, was, it was very well written too. I like yeah. I saw the game marketed on GOG, but I never was interested in it. But he did a very con- convincing job. I was like, oh, maybe I should try it out. Also, shout out to his uh, his username. You notice in the screenshot, Bizarre Chad One. Nice touch. Uh, good. So yeah, Tony, the UI design is really good in this. <laughs> yeah, mostly well written review, um, and it's interesting and and adds to like. The fact that there is a game review in here at all adds to the sort of texture of the presentation and like builds the sort of the vibe that the overall magazine project is going for, and I think does kind of set it apart from the other from the other projects in the, in the space. So, 
Yeah, because the, the magazine is kind of, it's the community as object. Like, the whole point of it is like, oh, I wonder what Arbogast and the gang are saying today. Like, they can, like, even remember how old magazines should have letters. I think we should have letters or, like, a commentary or, like, posting the best comments or something like this. Like, a, a magazine was you a mean like the, event. something like the New Right Post? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The <laughs> New Right Post. Just, or you're just, where you're aggregate, I, I say just, but it, I'm sure it's a absolute shitload of work but yeah yeah you're, ag- you're aggregating the best posts and long reads like yeah mm-hmm. that's that's what he's doing yeah for sure. cookies mag actually made it last week by the way shout, shout out to dimes yeah to, uh, dimes for actually writing it and having the clout to get people to read it Listen, i was just in it for the murder of brett kreshner so but brett um Kreischer? yeah that one <laughs> <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't deserve to have his name properly pronounced he can't even afford yeah. a shirt um all right well uh then gabe do you want to do you want to tackle the next one by yes the the the, the, uh where where old arbogast (laughs) is currently yeah where old arbogast (laughs) is currently two of three things we've covered in this uh the necropolis of smiles yeah he really is the mickey spillane of uh of our scene but um so it is the necropolis of smiles and written now, you see here's where it gets esoteric, right? So from the even beginning, there's a subtle Straussian through line here, because if you look, it says written by, and actually the letter A is actually hidden. You actually have to mm-hmm. move the page to actually see the A properly. So it just looks like it says Arbogast, but in reality, it says Arbogast. So the beginning of the story. The difference it's really comes through in audio. <laughs> yeah, you can you can feel the texture in the pronunciation. Yes. <laughs> um. All right, so the opening story, it is about our, the, our main protagonist. He is uh, hanging out with a pr- professor of, uh, I forget what he's a professor of, but the professor's name is Matthews. It's a rainy day. He just had an accident. It's kind of oblique. People think he fell off the horse, and that's why he's kind of sick and has after side effects. And uh, he's, it's, a, it's, a storm, it's a rainy, stormy night, classic Agatha Christie pulp right there. And uh, he's hanging out with his professor Matthews. And they start talking, and Matthew starts telling him stories about this uh, old family in the swamps. Now, the protagonist reveals to us that in reality, he himself was not in a horse accident, what like his, uh, everyone assumes. He actually tried to kill himself with a butter knife, as he quotes a, a, like a, a low-grade version of seppuku. No, low-country seppuku, as he says. So he, he got a bunch of painkillers, a bunch of, like, amnesith, and, uh, Literally dug a butter knife into his stomach until a lady walking her dog found him. And it's all because cause he was such a young man and a horrible e-girl broke his heart. So he doesn't know that Matthew does not know this. So it's a rainy night and he starts giving out these books. He opens a book and he starts talking about this old family. I can't remember the family's name. Uh, coffins, the Coffins. Yes, yes. <laughs> Like from uh, it was the, it uh, was two it was it was two families it was the the coffins and the what Stevenson is it yeah two? oh yes, no so Stevenson the, no Stevenson coffin was uh um the name was of the, the sci, was the scion of of the coffin clan and then and, there was uh, another and then there was another family that they had uh, that they had a bit of a feud with. Now, remember, the Coffins, as typical urban northerners, were gentrifiers. They were trying to gentrify the South because they're actually from Boston, and they only got into the slave trade. They picked the worst time to get into the industry <laughs> of slave yeah. trading, <laughs> like in, right in the middle of the 18, like late in the 1840s. And uh, so they, since everyone in the South does not like them because they're foreigners and they're basically yeah, gentrifiers, basically, so they had to circumvent um, all the rest of the southern families. How did they do that? They team up with Arab slave traders because the son, the Zion, as he said, uh, Mr. Stevenson, he was kind of like a Zion. dilettante. Zion, yeah. He was a little dilettante. <laughs> he went to Egypt with his friends. And, of course, he, got, he ended up getting enslaved by Arabs. But using his white boy charms, he ended up becoming friends with these uh, uh, Arabs. Ooh. Hopefully sphincter A real intact. Lord Miles. Yeah, a real Lord Miles. <laughs> Except in, the, in this case, his butt cheeks were untampered with. And, um. <laughs> Damn. 
<laughs> so he basically becomes a, a mafia, basically. They become pirates, basically, and just start raiding ships off the coast of, like, America with his little Arab, like... And the thing is, they even come to him to the U.S. So he has an Arab bodyguard with him, like a bunch of Muslim warriors. And then, mm-hmm. eventually, once the fight breaks out... Actually, no, no, no. I lie, I lie. They This isn't during this cold civil war. This is actually during the Revolutionary War. Remember, because the Stevensons, the Coffins, are actually loyalists. So yep. during the Revolutionary War, they end up getting attacked by radical patriotic groups and having their houses burned down. And as he's revealing the story, about it, they have a very nice images showing um, statues and uh, the occult and Arabic figures. Some of it's AI, I think. Some of it isn't. And as he's telling him this story, he slowly reveals the occult element that when the patriotic uh, people start burning down their house and finding Stevenson's personal belongings, they started finding cult objects, like literally like Baphomet, like the female one. And like not only Baphomet, but literally like bodies of dead children and the Max. And of course, our protagonist is horrified by this. And uh, they literally show a picture of the mask. And um, the one note of criticism before I finished telling the story was that I really wish he used the crying metaphor for the rain on the window. If y'all remember the crying metaphor of the rain, I really wish he put that metaphor right after the masks part. Because the whole point of the mask was that sometimes the members of the cult had to kill their own children. So they had to wear the mask to hide their tears. It would have been a nice of like textual symmetry if he actually had that line instead of just using it to describe like literally the rain earlier. That would be synergetic with a theme right here. If he just mm-hmm. took that paragraph and put it here, it would have been nice. But, um, but other than that nitpick, um, so him and Matthews, he, Matthews basically kind of grooms him to come go into the <laughs> old lands. Grooms him very suddenly. Basically, he's like, now that I've told you this story, we're going there right now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Get up, you At cripple. exactly this point, yeah. <laughs> this, yeah, into the pouring rain. Listen, he has mastered the Discord grooming speedrun. All right. <laughs> <He literally, laughs> we have so much to learn. <laughs> he gets him drunk. He gets. He grabs him by the shoulders. Right, and he, he basically says, "Come on," and so because apparently there's stories of like natives or the descendants of the Arabs on this little small island. Yeah, the, the descendants of the Barbary pirates were still hanging out there, being, you yeah. know, weird inbred, uh, <laughs> and yeah. literally chucking, Doing chucking spears, shoot to on sight. Yeah, is the rumor. And uh, and uh, and uh, the protagonist is like, "Okay, damn, that's crazy." And then Matthew stands up. Mm. And like uh, he gives him the book, he takes away the book, he turns the page for it. Our protagonist gives it back to him. The protagonist is like, "Damn, this is." He even apologizes for saying this is some satanic shit, basically, because he's apparently our protagonist is Presbyterian. Because he's like, "Man, this, this just sounds like satanic bullshit." And the, and the professor Matthews just goes like, "My boy, it's time for adventure. Come with me. This minute, this <laughs> instant, at that very, it's downpouring. No and, time like this, the present." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, midnight on a Friday night in the pouring rain. You, you really feel the pull of the weekend. <laughs> yeah, I. It was um, McNaughton esque. The like, I knew exactly what was going to happen. At this Miles McNaughton of Unreal Fame for anyone not familiar, um, the, the author of the great story Twin Candles. Yeah, Twin or- Candles. Just, just uh, as soon as he was like, "Oh, we're going there now," I was like, "Okay, I know exactly everything's going to happen." I know it is pulp, but for me, I was like, "I wish, I wish there was a little bit more of like a time jump or something else, just to obfuscate it a little bit, give me a bit of a twist there." No, well, that was... there's elements of the, the thing is, it's very, it's a straight lace like story because he takes him to the island. Uh, it turns out there's nobody there, and the thing is, he's actually his prose is very good because you you feel them going through the grass, the island described perfectly. You can see the little tiki huts they have, and um, our protagonist actually starts dancing uncontrollably, and, um, and Matthews is mm-hmm. laughing like a madman. He is grinning ear to ear. And he's like, "Oh, don't worry, but my boy, the the Arabs have this uh, story about the genies, and they make you dance. Come with me to this. Um, come to me to this backroom closet of a of a hut." And uh, he takes him inside there, and he makes him put his hand in a jar. <laughs> and he's like, and, and our protagonist just goes with it. He just puts his hand in a jar, starts feeling it. He's like, huh, there's something squishy inside here. Peeled course, grapes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Matthew's... My mom already taught me this one. <laughs> Can't trick me. 
Matthews. And, and of course, Matthews is like, it's the, it is the body of dead children. And he, tur- of course, the protagonist turns around and Matthews, to our shock and awe, and it turns out to be a cultist and slams. I know, right? It's the only other character in the story ends up being the cultist. <laughs> yep, and, uh, and he's and he's he's wearing the mask that uh, that uh, that that Mister Coffin was was said to have worn during the sacrifices. This this mask with a with a leering grin on it. Yeah, and uh, he actually stabs him at the exact same spot that he tried to kill Sapuku himself with. Yeah, yep, stabs him in the gut. Which, to be fair, I don't know if you would... Could, could you run with a giant stomach injury like that? I mean... Your muscles are still working. You're probably losing blood. It's not the biggest issue with a stomach wound. Yeah, but if you reopen an old wound, I just assumed that would be painful like a bitch. Mm. Which actually was my, my issue with that. That specific description I had flagged as falling flat for me. The exact line is, I turned... I turned in time to see Matthews pull from behind his back a large hunting knife. With one downward stroke, the blade connected with my stomach. The wound was practically in the same spot as my self-inflicted one. The blood started pouring out immediately. My God, Matthews, why? Rather than answer, he moved to stab me again. I shielded my face with my arms. This effectively blocked the attack, but left both my hands with defensive wounds. Um, and to me, that that one was like it was like a little too... It was very general um, terminology. Are you saying and it you wasn't want a lot more of specificity? <laughs> oh damn! I was trying to avoid that word, but yes, yeah, more or less. Like that was that really jumped out to me as like, like you just got stabbed in your like your most yeah. sensitive spot of your body with a huge knife, and you're just like, oh, I was struck in my stomach. I blocked with my my arms. I received a small arm injury. So it's like, <laughs> you know, let's talk about blood gushing. Let's talk yeah. about agony. Let's, let's and, talk about you know a gash along your index finger splitting, you know, splitting it partially off from your middle finger or something mm-hmm. like that. You know. Yeah, yeah. That and, and there was a bit of that throughout the story. It was kind of like I said, it, it, this, the overall the ring quality was very good. But I, there were several other parts where I was like, just a little bit more. Um, it could have been cranked up a little bit more. Yeah, give me the gore. It's like playing an old CRPG. He just has minus five to arm health. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, we want the Deus Ex. Like once your legs break, Ugh. you're you move really slow. Give me that. Give me that tech. And, but the ending is quite good because so he runs mm-hmm. away from yeah. him, and the, the tension of him chasing was quite good. He hides in a hut. The guy already pe- peeks his head in there. He walks away. He bolts out of the little island. But apparently it's only a couple hundred feet away because he collapsed. And then he gets up. And then there's Matthews just staring at him. Because <laughs> they're the... They describe it as he can see the mask, right? So here's the good one of the best lines in here of, of moment of tension is that he that weird feral animalistic moment when he looks at Matthews. The thing is he can't see his eyes. He he can't see him, but he knows Matthew sees him, and that you you see you can visualize the moment of him staring at this masked guy, which I assume is only a couple hundred yards away. But based on the way he describes it, he's like, ah, you know, the distance. You know, he could close it. He could close it. So there's a little comical sense that he only made it like a couple of feet away from the little island. Right. And uh, the final moments, Matthew just drops the knife. Actually. And chants in ancient Tunisian, actually. This is actually real Arabic. I looked it up. It actually is a Tunisian chant of uh, for a rain god. Uh, so he actually straight up pulls out some ancient Arabic and then uh, gets struck by lightning. <laughs> like an Elder Scrolls NPC accidentally casting destruction on himself. <laughs> and uh, he kills himself. It turns to ash. And our protagonist collapses at this site and then wakes up in a hospital. Uh, hospital. And his doctor is none a other nut, than a one. A nut hatch. <laughs> a, a, a loony bin. A loony bin. A, a whack a mole. Right? So, a that's whack house. Not, that's not a. No one, no one says that. Everyone says this. You, no you one says whack, whack house. A whack house. It's a whack house. That's <laughs> gooner yeah, terminology. That's, that's a gooner terminology. <laughs> it's, it's filled with wacky people. Yeah. Anyway, go on. <laughs> And and the and his doctor in the whack house is none other than one <laughs> Doctor Morningstar. Yeah. And uh, 
I'm, I'm pretty sure we can all know the connotations of that name. Yeah. You know, Pos- and- positively Luciferian. Yes. <laughs> really, really brings the light to events. The yes, light bringer, yes, if you yes. will. But um, it is, this is where the necropolis, that's where the actual the name of the book, actually the name of the story actually ties into the plot. It's because no one will tell him anything. The nurses are just smiling like dumb idiots. The doctors come as slightly Kafka-esque. The cops call, come in, ask him for details. He gives them the details. They don't believe him. So he's just trapped in this, mm-hmm. this minute little hell. And the doctor just keeps on telling him, oh, you're here for your own health. Don't worry about it. And he refuses to tell him anything. And uh, it's it's kind of hinted at because they talk about a syringe that they just might kill him anyway. <laughs> you know, because yeah. they talk, they give him a lethal injection. So he goes mm-hmm. full conspiracy brain and thinks either everyone here is in on it and was part of the cult. Or Smile, he's... <laughs> smiles, those damned smiles. Every orderly I see smiles like a gibbering idiot. The nurses, too. It's almost as if they had masks instead of faces. Smiling masks. The masks that denote death. But instead of a knife, the sacrificial instrument is a syringe. I know they're slowly poisoning me. They don't want the world to know about their religion. I was the lamb that ran away. Lucky me. Sometimes my black luck is worth celebrating. It is something to smile about. It's a great line. It's yeah. it's 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 like the it's ending a good, line is good great end. Line. And he was he is speaking of in the exact same terms at the very beginning of the story of his black luck. So yeah. it all comes full mm. circle. He does end up kind of killing himself by his own dumbass decisions. <laughs> now the the ending line of yeah. having I don't think Arbogast had to spell out that everyone was smiling. Yo, bro, they're smiling. Or like, was like masks. I, I don't think. I think you. I think you could trust a reader enough to make that connotation themselves. Oh, I like that. I like the the smile mask play. Yeah, for me, yeah, it's but strange. It's, but it's also I, the. I mean, but it's also like we are we are working in genre here, right? Yeah, for me, I, I really like the syringe as a sacrificial element. Because the syringe not only represents the sacrificial element for them, but also the black comedy of him. That from his POV, it's the reason why he's smiling because he wanted to kill himself anyway. <laughs> Matthew even bring uh, Matthew, I think, even brings up at the beginning of their fight. It's like, why are you fighting, dude? Didn't you want to kill yourself anyway? Because it turns out Matthew already knew that he tried to kill himself. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that most likely the lady that found him. Uh, yeah, was the, part the of line the is the line is literally why are he, he's he asks why are you trying to kill me, and Matthew says why did you try to kill yourself. <laughs> That's the, the, yeah. the perfect Uno reverse right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hypocrite. Uh. <laughs> wow, imagine if the rules were reversed. <laughs> oh, no, Matthews is a Redditor. He's like, mm, why, why didn't you try to kill yourself? Well, you're depressed, so if I kill you, then the total amount of happiness in the world goes up. So, <laughs> <laughs> No, that's what... How does that affect you personally? Yeah, no, no, uh, Math- a... Matthews... Matthews is an effective altruist. Like you know, he's yeah. like, listen, it's not altruistic to let you die because it's 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 actually like moral neutral. If I feed yeah. you to the gods, technically I've done more for good for humanity. Yeah, this is a, this is technically if if this if this occurred in Canada rather than uh, the Carolinas, it would be just a slice of life. <laughs> like, <just> like, <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, midnight at the maid system. Yeah, yeah. Would he would have just gone to the doctor, and they would have they would have offed him at the beginning of the story. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was a overall it's a quality pulp story. It's it's played clean through and through. the The most like probably meta part is the ending, where it's basically kind of one big joke at the end because they, they literally just kind of they're always prepping to kill him anyway because he is a sacrificial lamb. They literally let him recover a little bit from his own wound. Because he's basically trapped in a cage basically this entire time, so he never really he was doing well. From the start. I mean, there's also the you know, there, is he is he in fact a captive or is he insane or you know are are they, mm-hmm. you know are are they real cultists or has he gone mad? There's there's always the the tinge of the alternative interpretation, which is you know part of the part of the genre, right? No, no, it, you know, it does the 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 unreliableness, the subtle unreliableness of the ending does add a little taste to it. 
That he could literally just be mm-hmm. insane. And that he is literally just being, a, he's now a paranoid schizophrenic in some whack house at this point. And he's going to spend the rest of his days there. All right. Good on that yeah. one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shout out Arbo. It was a good one. Yeah. yeah I, I really did enjoy it. Enjoyable um, yarn. Um, <laughs> fine yarn. Could you nuke Cthulhu? Uh, I guess I'll do this one. Or Captain, do you want to do I'll, uh, I'll do nuke, nuke Cthulhu. You're itching for it. Go for it. All right. It. So this is a this is a um, uh, a sort of a, a theory cell moment. Actually, you know what? Does does it even? It doesn't even say on the title page who. Uh, it's Arkham. Oh, it's it's by written by Arkham Reporter. Okay, it's his. The, 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 there's no byline in the actual story. Uh, that they probably could have added that. Um, so could you newt Cthulhu? Is essentially, uh, it's. I mean, it is what's on the tin. So he he references the destructive power of of a nuclear weapon and whether or not Cthulhu uh, could be destroyed, uh, e- given his appearances in the mythos. Uh, this is something that I would have. This is something I would have really loved at one point in my life, but I I am I am since over the. <laughs> the canonical uh, arguments about these things. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I would say I, I'm somewhat nonplussed by it. Um, but, you know, he, he does mention, yes, in the, in the, in, in the, in the classic Lovecraft tale, um, Cthulhu gets murked by a boat ramming into him. Um, mm-hmm. It exp- explodes rather dramatically. Um, but then, um, but actually, then, but actually then he didn't get killed. But then immediately reforms. Yes, thank you, Gabe. Um, <laughs> and you know, you know that that which is dead may never this die. Etc. Etc. In the scientific method, the physics of Cthulhu, to an extent, he can be hit. Yes, people. yes, you can, you can, you can disembowel him or, or disincorporate him for some period of time. So. Perhaps if you were to, you know, vaporize every single one of his constituent molecules, he could be destroyed. Perhaps some sort of bomb, maybe not a fat man or a little boy, but a, you know, Tsar Bomba could do it. Um, and, you know, yeah. so it sort of just it sort of just takes that uh, takes that angle, establishes the rules of that he can that Cthulhu can be damaged and can also be reformed um uh but that uh uh but that you know theoretically one could say that you could uh you could uh completely destroy his mortal form but you have no idea of knowing whether or not he could reform basically i like that this is in here for thematic reasons for the for the magazine but it is not but is by far not my favorite piece <laughs> and is the kind of conversation that like it's the it's the kind of thing that i might be able, be willing to entertain as a conversation when i'm like six plus in but like yeah i mean you know just too reddit yeah for i was, gonna, I was too like, reddit I'm not, for I'm me i'm not gonna be too reddit this. for me i'm so sorry the, the reddit the, the reddit post that was recycled into this magazine was not your favorite part of it wow yeah it's too reddit for me um <laughs> who would win in a sword fight jamie lannister or darian darian oh, dude, when I, I remember when i was like 14 i used to always look up like you know batman because there was in, in who the, would in the win the, yes yes yeah who would win <laughs> But there are certain rules you have to have. You have to. Is does Batman have prep time? You always have the parentheses: prep time, no prep time. Their locations, everything. This is like yes. peak nerd culture question between the years of like 2012 and like 2017. Yeah, man. You know, 20 years ago, I would have been all in on this stuff. Like, I would have been all in on it. But it's well done for what it is. Oh, though. yeah. No, like it's, conceptually, it's fine. I feel similarly. It's not my banana it's not <laughs> that's my game it's not my there. banana <laughs> but, but, not but uh banana. it's but i enjoyed it listen you that, know for what it was that, that was not yeah. a gabian at all that was not absolutely non gay that was pinchonian Look, maybe, and i but and i gabian. and i also i i also do i acknowledge that the fact that it is in here in terms of the 
like this is the, this the, the biz archives is not a sh it's not like a short story collection right like these things are not necessarily supposed to just stand on their own merits and it seems mm. like if you are trying to go for this vibe that having some things like this <clears throat> could be like could be enhancing to the overall project while not being the best part of the any individual uh, issue. So like, yeah, I, I, compared to Unreal, which is yeah, just anthology. This is much more of a sort yes. of smorgasbord of of yeah. flavors. If if that was that it, yeah, absolutely. By. If that was in, if that was in, um, and I mean it, it. This it's also more of the character of the the Lovecraft diet challenge, right? <laughs> Lovecraft diet challenge is a mm. bizarre fucking concept. Uh, like, but I I did find it weird enough to to like. Um, you know, does the food, does the Lovecraft food uh, diet challenge count as a food analogy? No, it's not an analogy. <laughs> it's a food, uh, food yeah. fiction. It's food, food fiction. theory. It's, food, it's, food it's, more, it's, more, it's more like food hist, food lit, <laughs> food biography. I don't know. I like it. it's, yeah, it's a food biography. Um, no, actually, it, it's metafiction, right? Because he expects you, the reader, to actually consume. But it's not the fiction. Thing. He she pulled it from the real life letters of hp lovecraft well yeah yeah a metafiction in the sense that like it's based on it's like david foster wallace putting himself in the pale king right so he puts lovecraft's like it's it's diet. it's just it's not fiction it's not it's it's it's, it's, it's not <laughs> there's no fiction there's no fictive part of it <laughs> well there is the fictional element of putting it all in one week so maybe it's historical fiction because lovecraft never had it all in that order in one week or yeah, therefore yeah. This, I, I would okay okay all right <laughs> and, all and right. don't and don't forget this is all based on his letters <laughs> and, and, yes. and don't, don't forget this is from his letters so it's taking a pistolary as well it's a fiction. Okay, one, uh, but it's not delivered in letters battle. so it's not epistolary <laughs> <laughs> just, that's just the primary Jesus source. Pistolary understanding is just never. We're never, yeah, never going to fully get there. Never fucking get there. Um, I, I would meta complain on this. Um, like I said, I like the way it's written. I think it's well written. Yeah, conceptually, I'm like whatever. Uh, you know, no, no, no. But one conceptual meta complaint is the Lovecraft obsessionism. I get that's kind of the thing. You know, you're going for the you know the weird tales thing. But I, I I get a little bit of Lovecraft fatigue at a certain point. Um, and it's probably just because I've been around so long and everyone does Lovecraft because everyone can just steal a shit without fear of lawsuits. Um, man, at a certain point, I'm like, what about some? I don't know. What about some of these other guys? Where, where, where's my boy? Where's my boy? Cat? Where's my boy? Stephen where's, King? Where's he? Where's my? Where's my? Where's my? Uh, being, where's my being, King being as untalented hack shit lib. Yeah, probably riding on a boat right now, just crashing into people. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, where's where's my where's my carry fiction? Where's my lolly psychic fiction? Uh, I, I just did, find Lovecraft limiting. Also okay. um, <laughs> yeah, a, exactly. That's what I was referring to. I was referring to carry. Okay, but I mean, there are other there are other. Yeah, I I I, I get what you're saying, and that sometimes. Um, um, Oh my God! How am I? How am I stroking out on his name? Conan, the author of Conan, Robert E. Uh, Howard. Doyle? Robert, no, Robert, Robert E. Howard. Howard yes, oh, thank you, Howard. You're right. Yes, you're yeah. thinking of author Donan Coyle, who was. Uh, he Did was you the just say Donan Co <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the author of Shakespeare. Uh, not Shakespeare, Sherlock. Sherlock. He's the author of Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're right, Dave. That was it was like Sherlock Holmes. Oh, Sherlock Holmes. Yes, yes. I, I, I um, got the I got the I well, got yeah, the SHs and, 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 and Sher Sherlock Holmes is is some of it is public domain now already. So I think a large chunk of it is public uh, a, a, domain. Oh. Yeah, almost a, a fair amount of it is. The character is, but just some of the stories are still copyrighted. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, but there, I mean, there are people like uh. You know Fritz Lieber or Robert E. Howard or um, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Shout out to John Carter, uh, who mm -hmm. you know also deserve their time in the sun. Or uh, obviously the other mythos authors. I mean, I guess Howard did write um, some mythos stories, but um, there were a ton of other collaborators in that scene. So, mm -hmm. um, is John Carter public domain yeah. now or no? Uh, yeah, I believe I believe John Carter is now. 
I don't think. Uh, yeah, I have no idea, but by time it would make sense. Yeah. If remember. if not if not he's gonna be in like the next five years. Um, well, I, I think the reason why Lovecraft because I was thinking I was about to meme like LOL we need we more incel princess of Mars fiction, but I realized I just described the gore. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, yeah, and that's that's mm-hmm. not going to be public domain for a long ass time because John Norman's still alive. <laughs> John Norman's like still, in his late nineties or something. He's still gooning to this day. <laughs> oh my god, still <laughs> still trying. You know, a, a, a brief aside, uh, all sympathy to John Norman um, because women have only. Uh, uh, only forgotten their place more during his lifetime, and all he wanted to do was teach them that they're natural slaves, right? He's wanted to all, return, all, return. It's all he wanted to do. That's all he wanted to do. Yeah. You'd be happier. We'd be happier. Just you know, uh, become uh, uh, what the hell is what you were born yeah, to be? Yeah, uh, just just know. you know, you're you're never fully woman unless you're um, following orders from a man. So are, are 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 you really a woman if you're not chained into a sex dungeon? Hmm? It's not a dungeon. You need to be able to like leave to go like, you know, fetch water and tend to the animals and do all of the farm labor. <laughs> all the hair, if you, yeah. Are you really a woman if you're not in the harem 24/7? True. True. Like, yeah. Let's be honest. All the the ninety percent of the demographic who makes it to the fourth or fifth book in that series are kinky, horny women. I'm sorry. Uh, that's probably sure. true. That's probably true. Although, well, we, we should just cover John Norman at some other... Well, I don't know how we would cover it on this show, but we can talk about John Norman we'll at, some other, yeah, at some other... Yeah, at some other point, we can talk yeah. about John Norman. <laughs> we did my confession. Why couldn't we do John Norman? We, we did the Latina fetishes. We can do just the regular women fetishes. Just, yeah, just the BDSM fetishes. I mean, we covered um, Le Guin yeah. of old people. Why not Gore? fair all right and, uh, well anyway uh of that aside yeah i mean yes you could nuke cthulhu there we go <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah, uh, and, and just a, a quick aside by the way though the I, I get distracted by sex slavery as per usual by your horniness all right i was completely uncle in the scenario but um i wanted to say the reason why lovecraft is completely ripped off because he has an aesthetic all his own the Lovecraft aesthetic, it, it's like, it's easy to understand the shallowness of, it's an easy to understand on a shallow level. Everyone knows the fear of the unknown, man, and then the, the, the squid head, right? It's the, he, we all know Lovecraft for the fucking tentacles, right? It's the, you can never get away of Lovecraft and the fucking tentacle shit, right? People barely read like a, like a line mm. or two of Call of Cthulhu, never read anything else, not the reanimator, nothing, right? Or even mm-hmm. music of Eric Zane. So the reason why is because when you buy the Lovecraft package on the mimetic level on on the uh, on the meme plex, you got the you got you can have the pretentious fear of the unknown. You can slap that quote onto there. You got the squids. You got the cultists. But the the reason why it's not generic cultists, it's Lovecraftian cultists. Because you see, look, it's a book inside there, and it makes you crazy. Like it's a it's a starter pack kind of thing. It's it's literally a microwavable mm. story plot. You you throw it in the microwave, you get three act structure, you get some quote unquote depth, you get ethos, you get you get basically everything out of it. So it's very cheap. Uh, Lovecraft is very easy to very poorly copy without without needing to understand them in the slightest. Well, yeah, it's been compressed into a meme so that everyone gets it in a way Howard just never has been. Um, who else? Like Clark Ashton Smith, mm-hmm. who I referenced earlier. Like you can't... He, everything he wrote was weird and like weird in different ways. So it's hard to just be like, oh, this is very. I well, he did all yeah, the, I, he I, did I, all the other mythos stuff that nobody talks about, with like the dreaming yeah. and Woden and and things like that. Yeah, that that was like made it less doomerish actually. So mm-hmm. yeah, it, yeah. It's just I, I don't have the perfect answer. I'm not at all bashing them. It's just an interesting topic, like as a broader culture, like why i feel like we fall into this and maybe other episodes or other um issues they do aren't as lovecraft focused i i just feel like as a culture i I, i've definitely hit lovecraft saturation unless it's something really clever or fun um yeah 
and I, and I blame I blame our legal system <laughs> largely for that as <laughs> yes, well as yes. as well as the memes. Listen, uh, thank I, you, listen America. sidebar: we hundred percent support Disney's um, fight to make the copyright laws longer. We want the copyrights to be infinite. Thank you very much. We want it to never end. Why has no one? Speaking of, since, since you remember how Steamboat earlier this year, Steamboat Willie became public domain, and everyone, mm-hmm. uh, you know, had fun with that for like two days. But then the discourse moved the fuck on. Like, where's my, where's my Steamboat Willie, uh, like, shit post fandom? You know? Oh well, well, the, oh someone, God, dude, someone made a horror that, game out of it. The animated thing coming up for us. What? Oh, let's uh, put it in there, Dave. Oh God, uh, Dave, <laughs> Dave, yeah. Steamboat Willie. All right, yeah. and I'm that, that's it. just whistling. But there's only two characters in Steamboat Willie. There's no, there's three. It's a uh, it's, well, it's Pete, who? Minnie, and Mickey. Uh, okay. Anyway, all right. Moving on. As the snow thaws, by Froskaz. So this is a. I guess you call it a historical fiction of um, sort of Indo-European Ice Age Americans <laughs> in progress. I don't know. I guess I just I'll just head off by saying I feel like this one is like two two workshops short of where I think it would need to be um, to be to be put out. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I just had a lot of issues with it in terms of. The, like the writing itself, some of the way things were shared, the opening, opening with dialogue, unattributed dialogue, um, just a really struggled to have mental and mental picture. Um, as I, you know, as, as I was sub vocalizing this, I was just like, <laughs> like, where are they standing when people are saying this? Like where, like there, there was so much of that, like confusion and just like, yeah, very draft one for maybe someone that just is, um, yeah, just to have some things down. Yeah, and, and the placement um, is very vague. I agree with you. Like, cause he, he one at one moment he describes that apparently they live in a city. He either uses the term mm-hmm. city, <laughs> and I'm like, wait, where the fuck yeah. is city in this? Like, they just he literally says they just invented like the wheel or like the wagon wheel or like the wheelbarrow in the first paragraph. Like, this is supposed to be like pre-modern. Like, this is Hyperborea basically. I, it's it's yeah, it's uh, like Copper Age or something. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I do. I very much do not want to pile on the person with this, but I would say that that what I just said was my my major concern. My other major concern was kind of to your point, Gabe. The POV was a bit weird because it would float between yeah this sort of all knowing, um, like yeah the wheel was just invented and talking about things in that context, like how a present person would discuss it, and then at other times it would be a little bit more um, close. Uh, limited kind of style talking about as they would like but one that stood out to me the other was the city it references a city or you know those like where they where they were living but then he ran past they called them primitive dwellings and he calls it he used the word alleyways too by the way he literally uses the word alleyway yeah Yeah, it's just like mentally picturing that like what is a primitive dwelling to this person or is that a modern view of a primitive dwelling and to me that's just like i'm not not having mastered well it like POV. This is, well, it's also the. I mean, this is literally what um, Le Guin. Le, what Le Guin was talking about in our mm-hmm. in in when we when we covered um, uh, Elfland Pe- from Elfland to, Pe- to Poughkeepsie, right? Mm-hmm. Which is that you can do this like you can do this sort of like manufactured kind of dialogue, and you can do these fantastical perspectives. But it has to be like internally true. You can't just you can't just take uh, it, this like this t- kind of anachronistic uh, type of uh, language and perspective when you do it, or other or it's going to come out sounding like very discordant, right? It's going to come out mm-hmm. sounding um, you're you're going to lose the enchantment. And I think that's I think mm-hmm. that's th- the problem because I think the concept of setting something in this like, um, this like very much prehistory dawn of civilization, um, sort of, sort of setting, I think that's I think that is very interesting. 
Um, mm -hmm. And there are a few things in this story where they get into, <laughs> there's sort of this like Theoden character, the Grima Wormtongue vibe going on between two, uh, between two of the, the characters. Um, and it's, it's literally like the ancestors who both um, provide provide proof of guilt for a crime that is committed and the punishment for the guilty. So like that thematically is awesome. Like it, that's really, it, that's really cool for, to me, but the, mm -hmm. the, yeah, the execution has like these, these spotty, <laughs> these spotty things in terms of, you know, all right, it's why would this guy call them? Why would he call them primitive dwellings? It sounds too, like you know it, it yeah it, that's that wouldn't be in their linguistic yeah. catalog to even it, it's like the ap it, it's like it's the really ap style sticks. guide right we don't we don't yeah. we don't call them mud shacks we call them primitive <laughs> dwellings <laughs> yeah or it'd be a, a roundhouse would be how oh. i would probably phrase oh, it right. like you yeah. know what i mean that was how ancient dwellings would be or a longhouse or a roundhouse <laughs> um Yes. Well, listen, as as a Mediterranean, I'm highly offended that snow players <laughs> try to use the term city. <laughs> listen, we cities are our thing, damn it. Well, you snow monkeys were in the snow, and you all your Teutonic forests. No, listen, we were building civilization. We made cities, thank you very much. The internal city, baby. It's stolen valor. It's culture appropriation. I did not like that part of the book at all. Thank you very much. Yeah, You're a, you're yeah. a Slav. Bud, <laughs> <laughs> listen, Croats are listen. The the Illyrians were, were there's actually um, the last great empire. I forget his name, but the little great um, emperor's villa. There's actually an emperor's villa in Dalmatia, Dalmatia or Croatia. It's the last in fully intact Roman villa is in Croatia. Thank you very much. We are the inheritors. Why are your Slavs always like this? Yeah. Always Romans. Oh, always my like ancestors. This. Yeah, yeah. I don't even like, think no, Romanian Roma, counts as a romance language. <laughs> Listen, Get unlike out. Ellis, Get out. <laughs> listen, unlike certain Ellis Islanders, we remember our heritage. We have our roots. We are not disrespectful. Thank you very much. You constantly oh. claim to be an yeah. Anglo, Anglo, but you're a Croat. <laughs> no, I'm making fun of y'all for Anglo because it fucking uh, Lovecraft was Anglo. I, I was saying his diet was the Anglo like test diet. It was the founding stock testing diet. Okay. Gabe's brown. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it, <laughs> all right. Um, I'm bronze, I mean, all right. It's bronze with the sun and the sand and the sea. Oh, Lord. yeah. Okay. No, sorry. I just want to say this, the idea of the system because it's basically like King Lear, right? Or, or, or yeah. elements of like this. Basically, it's the main protagonist. There is the incel proud host versus I forget <laughs> Bright Hand. I think Bright Bright Spear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Bright Spear. So he uses very, very like old, like bright hand, like long hair, yeah, thick feet, hands, that yeah. kind of thing. That, those naming conventions. Also, yeah, which I believe is a Indo-European. Also, the like naming. Yeah, convention. and the uh, the love interest is called Elf Soft, and I just got to tell you, you know, I mean, Elf Soft, good, good description, good description yeah. for a lady, for a yeah, lady, she, for a lady friend. Yeah, she she's mm. definitely gonna make your Elf Soft. Uh no. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know about that. After yeah. use. After more, use it deflates. More like red helm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go on. <laughs> but no, I mean because they talk about the office commentary is like, dude, times are changing, like winter is thawed, like uh we have the wheelbarrow now. And so, <laughs> <laughs> yes. so the suitors yes. the, the, the the suitors for elf soft or soft elves. Uh, for softy, um, the uh, the he had to have complete challenges. So the the patriarch, the household, the owner of the daughter, right? Uh, you know, the person sadly being cucked in the situation. The father has to watch these two men <laughs> perform for their daughter, for his her daughter's hand in marriage. And uh, our boy Bright Hand uh, succeeds the challenges, but the father chooses Proud Host. Proud Host is the incel, and. Um, of course, Bright Hand's like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, the, the laws of our village and the, our custom is that whoever completes the challenges, this little mini Olympics, gets to cuck you and get your daughter. Right, that's the laws. And um, But the 
the father argues, well, the fundamental right, the oldest law, is the law of the father, of the law of the patriarch. I think it's, yeah, it's literally, yeah. well, one of the chapter pages is literally called the law of the patriarch. And there's this little conflict. Like, does he talk to the shamans? He mentions this. Listen, I'm going to bring it up to the shaman. Like, he goes full of law, uh, laws. And, uh, what is it called? Lawyer? Lawyer? Rule lawyer. Rule lawyer. lawyer. Yeah. Lawyer. Just regular yes. lawyer in this case. But yeah. <laughs> regular <laughs> lawyer. <laughs> I'm going to go to the shaman, right? He goes full redditor briefly before he comes to his based ancestors who tells him to just kill the old man. And, uh, and so I thought, oh man, it's going to be an interesting idea. It's going to be a conflict. It's going to be between who has the right of law. It's, it's very Carl Schmidtian, right? Who is fundamentally the power of the decision maker here? Is it with the father as it was in the old days? Or because, because the tribe is becoming slowly a civilization, it's becoming a society, it's becoming a group, the father will be forced or the protagonist will have to force the laws of this growing civilization into, listen, the marriage custom is whoever performs the marriage rights first and correctly is the winner. Your laws of a father are forfeit. So there's a good tension between these two. I thought that was going to be the tension, especially when he meets his ancestor, uh, his ghost ancestor. And he, his ghost ancestor is like, I don't, you don't need no damn lawyer. You got to do like the way I did, damn it. You got to get a sword and kill the fucker. And I'm like, okay, so that's the contention. He's going to kill his girl's father and, and basically get to have her or fight his, or fight his suitor. But they kind of pivot away. I don't know if you want to do the story recap or not, but it's revealed that kind of doesn't go that way in the plot. When he when he arrives to to demand his his rights of marriage, he finds that uh, proud host the uh, that that you are. I would probably call him the fox uh, rather than rather than an incel um, has has murdered uh, has the murdered father. the father. Um, yeah. And then subsequently Three. tries to pin it on, um, and, and this at the at this point the the reader does not know this tries to pin it on um, Bright Hand, and it take and it, it, it takes a shaman to resurrect. It's like straight up Arcanum. He resurrects the father's <laughs> ghost. I thought of that too. Yeah, yeah there, 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 isn't there a second ghost resurrected too? Isn't there like a two ghosts at the same time, bro? No, Moment. it was the the ancestors of. The ancestors of uh, Proud Host. No, no, they resurrect okay. Proud Host just to see his his family spirit should beat the shit out of him for a right, second right, right, time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then and there's a mob that's rallied because of the um, is this they're, they're they're upset by all the 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 spirit raising, right? Yes, they're they're weirded out at first. They're weirded out like against the ideas of a changing world. That, but basically, this guy says, "Listen, we need to use the ghosts," and he, he pulls out a face hugger, basically for all kinds of purposes. From well, apparently the, the sh- well, the shaman the shaman is like is playing Columbo here, right? So he asks him questions. He's like, "Hey, yeah, one more thing. I've got a witch." Who's gonna resurrect the victim? The victim's gonna tell yeah, where'd us. Where'd she come from? He's yeah, just, she was just hanging out in the back. You're and your then, house there, bro. And then the 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 victim has a. And this is another cool conceptual thing here, right? That the victim has this like fucking parasite attached to his literal to his literal soul. Has this parasite that Proud House has, has introduced to him. Uh, which was what allowed him to be basically, you know, worm tongue theodining to, to be mind controlling mm-hmm. the the victim here, uh, the father. So, um, so it's it's horrifying because you know the the ancestors as soon as this this spirit face hugger is ripped out of this ghost uh, and and fully exercised. Then uh, all of the other, uh, all of all of his ancestors show up because they weren't going to let him like live with them because he had this weird bullshit attached to him, right? They're like, ah, oh, your your spirit has this gross thing on you. Fuck that. So, uh, uh, so it, it is discovered that you know Proud Host has done this thing that not only would have, you know, not only resulted in the death of this guy, but would have resulted in essentially his eternal perdition from the rest of his family, which is the most horrifying thing they can think of. Yeah, so, when, you, when you have spirit SCDs and the whole family shuns yeah, you for yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So he was, <laughs> so Prados is like, oh, well, you know, I didn't really know, but also, 
you know, if we don't if we don't let the aliens in, then we won't survive. <laughs> Uh, so he dies. So he dies, and then uh, and then they bring him back, and all of all of his family's ghosts show up and uh, stomp him in 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 death as well. No, the, yeah. no. First, the, the protagonist good. and his girlfriend literally eat his heart out of. Oh his yeah, chest. yeah, yeah. They they stab him and eat his heart. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Just throw yeah. that in. Yeah, and it ends with a with a big party. Yeah, it, it is hilarious. It's it, it is so it, it's the strongest scenes is the opening scene. And the ending scene, you can tell that that was probably the most like sharply envisioned part of the story in his mind. Yeah. And everything in between the connective tissue was the hardest part or the most thinnest part. And there's definitely a sense of the comical because this goes zero to sixty. His poor Prados. Yeah, <laughs> he gets beat by the uncle, uh, by by the brother of the man he kills. He has his eat hardened out by Giga Chad uh, and the the girl he wanted to fuck. Dies in incel, gets resurrected spiritually, and has his like Giga Chad ancestors beat the shit out of him in the spirit realm before finally dying. Yeah, shame for display. Shameful the, display. The uh, but again, yeah, I mean, this is this is a conception. I, I I think this this story is conceptually very strong. I think that I think like you said, David, like the 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 word choice. The way that the way that it was presented needed some some working on um, in order to be to be a hundred percent. But I definitely yeah, think yeah. that like you know, I think I think if I think if Frostgar's like edits a little uh, edits a, get, gets into the gets into the nuts and bolts of his next one, I think I think you were you know we're gonna see some some good stuff from him. Yeah, absolutely. Keep grinding. It was not. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's all I got to say on it. Um, just those uh, points of critique, and then let's just keep cruising, baby. To Potter Sanguinis. Potter Sanguinis by Bertram Hainsworth. And actually, who who who'd like to think of crack no, this one? First? I can do this one. This one is Go a very cozy it. read. So Potter Sanguinis, if you're uneducated and illiterate, it means um, father blood. And uh, it's a very. I also, I gotta say, I gotta compliment the UI again. Each of the stories have different colored pages to reflect their theme and like background art. And I, I really like the background art for this. It was yeah. very well done. Yeah, these are all fully illustrated and and have have color and design theming in every story that is completely unique to the story. So, yeah, hats off for that. Yeah, but the, the overall theming of this one it reminds me of uh, one of my favorite video games, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, in terms of the mood, like the 90s has a very mm, 90s opening. Yeah, it, the cityscape too. Yes, the cityscape. The, the, the opening prose is beautifully descriptive. So our protagonist is a Roman archaeologist slash researcher, and it's it's in New York City. It's raining. He closes down his office for the night. He he scribbles down vividly, uh, Father Sanguinis, or like uh, the final pieces of the puzzle, basically. And he leaves his office for the night. And you see the sign flapping in the wind. You can it's you can literally see the TV set. You can literally see it in your mind. It's very very campy, but in the best way possible. And he goes back home, and he has a little package. He opens the Amazon package, and it's revealed that there's a knife. It's literally like a, a dagger. And uh, with a little gem on the side of it on its hilt. And he also uses proper terminology to describe Roman clothing and Roman sword design, which is I thought was actually a very nice touch of the author, by the way. Um, the way he described togas and the little belts they had. Very nice touch, Mr. Mr. Bertram. Um, so he does a ritual. It turns out that our Roman lore expert actually is um, basically kind of a, a warlock. He actually is a pagan. So he practices the blood ritual. He starts opening his veins uh, into the cup with the knife. And he starts like blood thinning himself to fa- summon Pater Sanguinus, Father Blood. And uh, while the storm was raging outside, finally he sees his blood like his man made out of a volcano, basically. But instead of lava, it's blood. And uh, he peers before him. And this is where it gets very wacky or very much like a side quest from Bloodlines. <laughs> is he summons him that he's like, oh shit. He, he, like, he sees the blood thinning from both his hands at this point. Because like 
Father Sanguinus has literally possessed his other hand to cut the veins from his other arm. At this point, he looks down, and you can literally see him. He's like, you know what? I didn't think this through. <laughs> so he's like, wait, wait. <laughs> he's like, wait, I can get you some more blood. I can get you more blood. So Father Sanguinus temporarily lets him stop bleeding and lets him put the knife in his pocket to talk to his like IT nerd neighbor. <laughs> Bro, did anybody else think of incel reading this? Yes, there, were, there was definitely incel, except at least the IT neighbor wasn't getting cut. At least the, he wasn't also mm, <laughs> thank God. dying of terminal yeah, disease. Just, it's just his die. <laughs> and, also, and died in a relatively unpainful way, I'd say, for the most part. It's... No, except for the eternity part. But <laughs> <Yes. on. laughs> Well, the ending is ambiguous, whether or not it's like a negative ending per se. All right. Because... Uh, <laughs> Wait, what? All right, we'll, I get to yeah, it. We'll get I, to I, it, I, and then we'll thoughts. talk about that <laughs> assessment. <laughs> we'll get to it. We'll get to it. So he lures the IT nerd into his house because he has computer troubles. Because he, he pretends to be a boomer and doesn't know how to work like the um, school email. And he, I, I don't think the IT nerd even says a line of dialogue. I think it's probably like three lines. He walks in there and he tries to jump him. But of course, since um, the professor is a, is a word cell and not like an actual like Chad, he doesn't know how to fight properly. So they, they squirm us. He tries to stab him in the neck and he gets blood all over the walls. The, the, the pros at this point, by this nice touch, describing the, the blood on the walls. Until he finally grabs the IT nerd's head and slams it into the kitchen um, island. Yeah. And finally, the IT nerd dies a peaceful death. And then has all this. Ah, uh, yes, a peaceful death. <laughs> <laughs> getting getting your brain smashed out on a on a countertop. A peaceful death. Finally, <laughs> I can rest now, sweetie. <laughs> no, I, th- I think he. Must, I, I think it, I'm coming listen, to join you, Janice. <laughs> <laughs> listen, all the fights I have been in have ended in like three punches. But I assume if you're going for a long brawl, like I assume this was like an awkward fight that lasted between. Five to fifteen to twenty minutes. I saw. I assume his body, for the most part, was pretty numb to everything at this point. Like I, I'd rather be numb to pain before having my head slammed into an island, rather than going into brawl having my head slammed into an island. Well, you know, so that sure. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving on. Anyway, anyway, so he he makes he says, "Hey, he's you know our protagonist. He's tired. Actually, what is his name? His name is Alistair. Alistair, yes." Uh, Alistair looks up from the, the guy. He's like, here, Father Patinas, I got you your blood. And Father Seguinus is like, dude, my whole gimmick is I'm a blood god. I think it's just I, not enough. This is not enough. One dude's not enough blood, bro. <laughs> yeah. I, have, I haven't been here for a thousand years, dude. Gonna, I got a lot of catching up to do. So he, I, Alistair kind of accepts it. He, he goes through like a character or micro character arc where he kind of accepts his death and he kind of accepts his responsibility he has. So he slits his own throat. It takes a, it takes, he takes a moment of tremendous courage. Uh, slits his own throat. And then both their bodies disappear. The apartment building is in complete disarray. He's like, okay, I'm going to be an equal. I'm going to be just like Father Seguinus, man. I'm going to be like a god. Right? And then he goes into the blood realm. And it's just like literally like the floor is lava, but the floor is blood. And there's this bunch of slaves of Sanguinus just mixing the blood like a giant Kool-Aid thing. Like they're literally mixing with giant sticks. And all you hear is this Sanguinus, Sanguinus, Sanguinus throughout the entire land for an all of eternity. It was a cool end. I love this one. I, I thought he had a really specific vision in mind and he just nailed it. Um, the, the description of Sanguinus, I think he's almost described as a statue when they first see him too, like a marble statue with like sort of the blood cracks mm-hmm. or yeah something. it's a like volcanic it, that, that one stood out to like me volcan- like molten yeah. lava like he literally uses the word volcanic if i recall correctly yeah a great like crossover that's also like pompeii and really good i um i don't know if it's a happy ending to be eternally damned to me you know because your douchebag neighbor you know got in over his head Why not? like, but, like um, listen this is what they do stirring lakes of red with nettled rods revealing eel-like creatures they were forever destined to filter through the grime of human adoration amassed before them. So they're, they're basically just kind of like uh, trash people, like trash men. They just kind of work mm. on the dumpster of blood, basically. It, it doesn't even sound necessarily that helpful. I mean, yeah, being a wagey sucks, but you know, compared to the other <laughs> sorry, got Sorry, got my uh, et- et- eternal length shift on the blood barge. 
We're pretty short-handed, so it's probably going to turn into a double. <laughs> listen, we... Still be working IT. Like, Basically, listen, yeah. <laughs> One, the IT whispers to, like, uh, Alistair, like, you know, we should ally, We should probably unionize. We should unionize. We should, we should. God. Actually, guys, I, got, I have a little bit of unknown knowledge. I actually know the, the author of this. Oh, yes. It's just, it, this is ARX Han's new ending. <laughs> this is the ARX Han's new ending. This is the rewrite. This is the rewrite. It was, it takes a, Anon gets a, gets takes a dagger. A real, the takes last a chapter. real uh, left turn at the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the secret canonical ending. I decided to abandon <laughs> STEM and start studying the classics. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's what Anon, right? Anon Alistair? His name was Alistair. Oh time. my god. The A, A, A. <laughs> All right. But I have nothing else to say on it. Just, yeah, two two Fun. thumbs up. Really short, almost said. flash almost flash fiction length. Really. Yeah, but very well, yeah. well yeah. performed flash fiction. I, I really, there was much more atmosphere and just like campy coziness to this story. You want to do the next one, Cap? Uh,. The eyeless man. Yeah, the uh, so the eye the eyeless man is uh, it's uh, it's a creepy pasta. It's a hundred percent a creepy pasta. <laughs> it literally uh, is a creepy pasta. Yeah, it literally, it's not even have a name. It's literally yeah. by an ad on. Like, no, it, it it no. It starts with no. It's the it's the no. It it it, it starts. The first line is his name. It says my name is. No, Just- I mean, there's no author. My name is Justin, and I'm from Delaware. After I graduated high school in 2002, I was, accept- I was accepted into Rutgers University. I originally began attending at their campus in Newark, but after switching majors, I eventually ended up attending classes at the Rutgers campus in Camden. For those of you who don't know, Camden, New Jersey is an abject shithole. It has a higher murder rate than Philadelphia, and the college kids who live there are often a target of muggings and assaults. So, it's... um. Like this is it. It's like this very sort of like too much personal backstory sort of beginning description for a creepy pasta. You know what I mean? How they often have like mm. something extraneous. Um, it, it's always a kid moving to a different town. Yeah. And well, was... and it's also like who cares if you went to Rutgers in Newark? <laughs> like it's, 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 it never never comes up again. You know, it's dude. It's uh, realism. It trying doesn't... to make it believable. No, I know, I know, I know exactly. It's it's like it they're trying to make it believable and like it's it's part of the like the beginning of a creepy pasta always has something something like that um so the uh essentially he gets he gets a shitty job at uh he gets a shitty job as a security guard working nights um at a mall and um or not he not nights he's he has whatever shifts but he gets a shitty job working security at a mall and there which is another like trope of a creepy pasta where someone has like an, an incredibly menial job it's like a gas station attendant or or you know rent a cop or what have you so um and women start coming out of this one particular bathroom claiming to have seen uh, a person in a hoodie who has no eyes and and this this person never does anything menacing to them uh never never harms them in any way is just very terrifying and it freaks all of them out so um eventually it, it, most of them uh you know won't even give a police report eventually they do that you know, and, and that's that's how he learns the full story. Um, and the, uh, you know, they request the video footage from the CCTV recordings to help identify the man. My manager and I scanned back and forth through the entire day of both incidents and didn't see any man entering the women's restrooms. We eventually had the theory that he was sneaking in wearing w- women's clothes, but on both occasions, everyone who entered exited shortly thereafter. We were stumped. Um, and so eventually, uh, uh, let's see, eventually they, um, he gets a call from, let's see, uh, 
But one evening, I got a call from this girl named Amy. She worked at the Aeropostale, and we flirted a lot. I told her all about the eyeless man, and apparently the whole time she was going into the bathroom trying to see him, Amy came over to my apartment right after work. She busted in and was really anxious and weird. She said she saw the eyeless man and recorded the sound on her phone. Smartphones weren't out yet, so it was this 30-second audio clip on her flip phone. All my roommates came into the kitchen to hear it, and it was like faint channels of radio stations that can't quite come through, but with an overlay of a baritone man's hum, completely bizarre and inhuman. It sent a chill up my spine. Another like great creepy pasta trope is like a weird sound, right? It's like some, mm-hmm. like some interference or a strange sound, like say the early skinwalker ones that are, that sound like a cat trying to speak English, you know? Um, and, uh, she described him as everyone else did zip up hoodie, black pants, leather shoes, medium height, very skinny, um, and absolutely no eyes and a pure white face. So the, uh, he, um, ended, he, so he ends up, uh, quitting his job and moving back home, uh, cause he's, he's not doing well at Rutgers. So he leaves the job. And eventually he tries to message Amy um, and her sister responds saying that she, um, that Amy died not long after he had last seen her. So he, um, he ended up, let's see, this is another good one. After a few months, I received a letter from the mall saying that they would charge me if I didn't return my uniforms. So I did a quick visit with my old roommates and dropped off my uniforms to my old manager. I had a brief talk with her um, and asked if she had heard about Amy. She did. Not only did she hear about Amy, she found out that every woman she could find that filed a police report also died within a few days of seeing the eyeless man. Then she said something that rattled the last bits of doubt and skepticism from my body. That wasn't no rapist, and that wasn't no alien. (laughs) That black-eyed man was the damn grim raper. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's right and like it's it's a it's a it's exactly the kind of like why would i go back oh obviously i would get fined if i didn't bring back my branded polo you know <laughs> like and <laughs> yeah. uh and then you know you have the the pu- the last line that's a punch line right uh, it's 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 a tidy it's a tidy little story. I mean this is two page this is two yeah. pages long. It's exactly as long as it needs to be like and ba- all good creepy pastas are this like uh superlative kind of camp, right? The bad ones are just like, you know, are 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 poorly ri- it's very easy to go from like high camp to absolute dog shit but this one is very tidy and I, 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 I dig this. Mm-hmm. I well, dig it, this. It, it, it ends more on the funny than because with a good creepypasta, like a lot of times they have very good buildup and then right at the end, they just completely decompress something ridiculous or right? try to overbite. This doesn't overbite, but it does kind of end comical. I mean, I mean, he reveals the well, death more, of his lover. More because of how, how, it was not, it was a random girl who he flirted with a couple of times. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, yeah, but a lover, it's a one sided lovership, all right? Yeah. She was his lover in his mind. <laughs> okay, reading right. a lot into it, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he literally learns the death of his lover from like a, a Shaniqua at the end. That's the end. <laughs> it's like it's like one of those scream movies much. or like those parodies of like Dwayne Wayne or whatever oh. the hell. Dwayne Wayne. Everything is indirect, which I really liked. You know, it's all from women, and then he's having consequences. And uh, yeah, it, it isn't. I guess that's more the, the creepypasta format, right? It's like it's not. You know, you don't get to see the monster typically. It's like right. you, you get secondhand. Yeah. It's a lot of like glimpses. Yeah. The, the, the technology won't capture it because they have a camera. That's a whole thing where they're like checking the camera and they're not able to find the guy. And there's this plausible deniability because there was a pervert. Once in the past, yeah, it's a slow burn because, yeah, like, really well you, you, it's a slow burn because if you if you didn't know you were wearing reading weird fiction, like, there's nothing supernatural until like a much more later on to the story. It, it really just sounds like there's some. Weird I mean, it's not really. I don't know how slow burn a 
two page story could possibly be but <laughs> it's very well it doesn't immediately reveal itself it's very believable right, the way he right. has the characters act the way the protagonist acts he's like oh man there's some weird homeless dude like just being perverse to women you know they're yeah. telling them <laughs> he's telling them they have less than one year <laughs> the grim reapers of the turns out the reaper just yeah the reaper just has, is a really great poster <laughs> <laughs> no Great one. So yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well done. All right. Moving on to the sieve of a witch by C.P. Webster, and this one well, is the about best ones, actually. I for yeah I for Williams yeah yeah this is a this is a great one. Um, I think it's actually it's all great from here on out. Basically, there was a little bit of a rough middle, and then everything is you know very similar to their their competitor. The uh, Unreal, Tales of the Unreal. So there's a little, little rough in the middle there, a little saccharin in the middle. Hey, do not defame uh, the whole good saccharin for comparing. <laughs> saccharin had soul. All right, thank you very much. But this one is, it's a little Lovecraft pilled. That'd be too Lovecraft pilled, I guess, because, you know, you have the ocean. Yeah, you have you know, the know, philosophobia what, the... angle. You have the, yeah. you have the uh, madness causing you to disregard bitches. <laughs> uh, well exactly yeah. well actually that's my literally my first point is our our protagonist i think it's pronounced i4 e4 i was saying i4 in my head but i've never met a person with a name spelled i f o r i do not recognize welsh as real people so i i do not care to, what their backwards language is but he's a true cell he's wandering the beach and he just comes across this little what what, would you, what does it even what does it even call it? Just a little like a little metallic like um, he, he describes it as obsidian. Object. It's like made out of stone. Obsidian. Okay, yeah. So this sort of artifact. Let's just call it an artifact. That might be the best way to keep it short. Is um, and he's like, okay, what is this? Yeah, he says it's it's like like it's not molded glass, but like a car- piece of carved greenish obsidian. That's what he says. And it's shaped like almost like an embryo with long hair. It's a- yes. Like like a gerbil shape, basically. And he's immediately interested in it. He said, "Okay, I'll take this home." He takes it back. He lives with uh, Mrs. Mrs. Kernow. I'm just and before we move on, gentlemen, what what do we think? Oh, she's a mommy. She's def- she has she has mommy energy. Look, so there is a there is a an illustration in here where she's looking like a slightly more matronly Julia Louise Dreyfus. I, I, I got that. Th- I got that feel too. Like it's the, the face, it's the smile. Yeah, no, she looks like Elaine. <laughs> but, but you know, like yeah. Welsh, the, the Welsh trad Elaine, <laughs> not not the Elaine Artho edit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no Artho edit of Mrs. Carlo. Yeah, but no um, blue ribbons to be seen. And and it turns out they you know they have a nice relationship. He's sort of um, thought about having a relationship with her in the past, but you know he didn't really. He's too much of a true cell. You know, he's not going to soil soil himself by, you know, disregarding beach. So, you know, disregard women, pursue the beach, wandering. He goes to his room, you know, just kind of enjoys his his uh, his new obsidian-ish artifact. And the rest of the story is, is mostly him just gradually, very, very well done, a description of him just having this increasing fascination with the object the way it is sleeping with it and then he wakes up and he looks in the mirror and he he has these um not welts but he has these sort of blisters forming on his skin these little gray dots yeah gray dots it's almost like an like um like something from the ocean like a like he's got urchins growing on him or not not urchins what was it um shit growing on him but anyway he's like he's whatever it starts with just like one on his on his uh his hairline and then um, you know, he's, he disregards it, you know, has breakfast with her. Things are kind of normal. He'll, thinks about watching TV with the old lass. Next day, it gets even worse. It gets even more severe, but he cares even less about it. He's more interested in his, his little artifact. And, 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 and why is he more interested in his Lovecraft, uh, in, his, in his artifact, Dave? Because he's having horny dreams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's got he's girls in his dreams. It turns out he is a fake cell this entire time. <laughs> he's been in a fix of this entire time. He, he's actually been horny for Miss Kerr now uh, for this entire time. He fantasizes about her, and he says that she wants him, too. Thank you very much. There's a lot of sexual tension when they watch the telly. 
I, so the yeah. So the first night he has the dream with the amulet, he feels like he's underwater briefly, and he sees the figure, and it's and it's and it's um uh, it's mommy Elaine and all her Kernel. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's mommy Elaine in all her curvy glory, right? <laughs> or all her frumpiness, and, and and they do the deed. And he notices, by the way, this is one of great piece of prose. This is a great story, by the way. I have my complaints about it, but this out of all of them is the most like unshined gem. Like it, it, the coal on this gem is only around the edges. You just need like brush it off. <laughs> you don't have to call it coal at all. You know, yeah. you, just, you just say it's good. <laughs> it's, it, it's a it's a battered gem. All right, it's a battered gem. So, and, and, and if you notice one of the good piece of prose, and when she's having sex, she's writing him. Notice, by the way, he's very passive in the sex. She's in control, by yeah. the way. And she's cold, and you know, like the ocean. Which will come back. And, and notice her hair falls into his face. And what does he see? He uses quotes. And it says that the hair has a life of its own. And, you, and you, if you notice the hair, one of the biz, strangest aspects of the statue was the fact that it had hair on it. So there's a sense element of the Gorgon, right? Or of a Medusa, right? The witch aspect, the, mm. the, the living hair. So that was a great piece of prose right there. And so he wakes up in the next morning. He feels like he's king shit, right? With a sexual tension. But he just becomes obsessed with this, not in a horny way. The the, the my eh, only critique of this it's kind of no, a no, horny it, way. No, it's not. It, his behavior isn't horny. It's not sexual. Like that, that's my big beef. Well, the, we'll get to the ending, then we'll get to the beef. Um, <laughs> but, so he becomes so obsessed with it to such a degree that he just basically spends all his time sleep gooning, right? You know, <laughs> bringing a whole new <laughs> well, and massaging it. Like he holds it in his bed and he's petting it. And, as he grows more more barnacle STDs, right? It keeps on mm. spreading. You know, it, he takes a whole other meaning to wet dreams, basically. Until finally, yes. one day, he he literally rolls around in the sand in the water just to feel clean, to stop feeling itchy, basically, because of his STDs. And so he comes back, and Mrs. Cornell has thrown away his beautiful little trinket. And so. <laughs> So you know the meme with the because she's, terri- like, uh, she's terrified of it. The Nintendo yeah. Switch. Yeah, she's terrified because she doesn't. She she she's jealous of the item because <laughs> he spends all his time. I'm sure, that's in his the room. reason. Yes, yes, Gabriel. Yes, yes, yeah. little Gaby. That's why. Well, listen. She wants to spend time with him. She constantly asks him to watch TV. She likes hanging out with him. They have a, a relationship. So by definition, she doesn't like it—the fact that she can't hang out with him because she's inside his room all day and acting erratic. Oh my God, she's been goon widowed. Goon- she has been goon goon widowed by the by the cursed totem. <laughs> That she can't handle it, and and he has a total to, to keep to keep the mean speak the Nintendo Switch way uh, yes, reaction. Yes, yes, I'm just going to find out. <laughs> oh, do you want to read it? Oh, uh, dude, no. We I was thinking for the video, like it was, it'll be a perfect sight gag to replace the <laughs> Nintendo Switch with the statue. <laughs> <laughs> the little yeah, a little talisman of some kind. He literally yeah, he grabs her, action consumed figure. by rage and desperation. <laughs> he slapped her hard and pushed her roughly. You stupid bitch! He wailed. It belongs to me. I belong to it. And then he leaves a sobbing woman on the floor. And coatless and shoeless, he ran from the house. And um, yeah, he he runs into the ocean. That's that's the last we see of him. And then the story ends panning to uh, two or three old old fishermen hang, hanging around, spinning tails. And one of them says, oh, yeah, they found old uh, old I-4. You know, poor, poor Mr. I-4 is dead. You know, poor Mrs. Kernow was going to miss him. But, you know, they, they say they found him. They say he was hard. Like, well, yeah, he just found the ocean. They're like, no, not like that. The Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So, so he went in full, fully this erect. Is, um, <laughs> and he came out fully erect. Um, the uh, Also, speaking of dialogue, the way that these, that these like, four old fishermen talk is, mm. is great. And is exactly the type of thing, mm. like exactly the type of dialogue that you would want to see um, out, out of a character like these. And they speak completely differently from Mrs. Uh, uh, Kernow and um, from I-4. And they're like, what do you make of that dead fella? The holiday maker was a drowned David Tremethek asked his neighbor at the bar, now sipping at his pint and itching his rough beard. The courier's full of it, front page news and all. Leonard Penrose nodded, but pushing back his skipper's cap, raised a figure to his lips. Come over here by the fire, Ansem, and I'll, <laughs> and I'll tell you about that, he said with a sly wink. 
The two fishermen moved away from the crowded bar to an empty <laughs> table by the fireside. Once they were settled and smoking their pikes, Tremethek prompted his companion once more. You know, poor Mrs. Kroonhow was quite beside herself about it. She told McCarthy that she was acting stranger for days. That is, before he attacked her and ran off and all. Itching he was, like he had a chicken pox. Though she could see nothing wrong with him. And it was just like, you know, they're, they're, he's adding the, the truncations of the words and, and dropping letters in order to make make the dialect clear. And the word choice itself is uh, is also is also distinct. Um, you know, Ooh. my Kathy, it's, you know, that that type of um, that type of. Well, you, you can't West, you can't West blue country ball. kind of thing. But well, you can't blue ball walls now. You got to do the rest of it. You gotta I can't do. do the, I can't do well, four distinct voices. Well, do, 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 do the boner line. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. <sighs> Barnacles, Tremethek replied incredulously. Why hasn't been missing that long? How do you get covered in barnacles in less than a week? But Penrose only shook his head. That's not the strangest thing by a long chalk. <laughs> what do you mean? Tremethek questions, eager to hear more. Why? The fisherman paused, reddening slightly. Well, my Jack says a coroner report says he was, uh, odd. Down there, I mean. <laughs> Penrose nodded meaningfully toward his groin. But the other fisherman now laughed dismissively. Oh, come on, you're having me on, Leonard. He said with a grin. I is not. You can ask my Jack yourself. The man returned indignantly. Ah, he was. But what's more? The corpse was bloody smiling. Nice. <laughs> see, so, nicely see done. that's that's how good the dialogue was. Like the, the, those are just absolutely charming. It, 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 it starts as a sexual sexual drama, like a psychosexual drama between this incel and this like mommy maid, and it ends with like a, a, a cozy <laughs> cozy fisherman bros hanging out. Yeah, <laughs> talking about yo, they found this weird loser who was just hard as fuck under the sea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This dude who just tossed himself end. into the ocean and and came came out, uh, yeah, a stiff, you might say. <laughs> but I'm bummed. I see. In, in, in a lot of ways, this is this ends kind of like with the um, with the eyeless man, right? It ends on a joke. It ends on coziness, right? Ra- rather yeah. than necessarily yep. creepiness. Uh, maybe maybe a tad bit of sadness, right? We feel sorry for Mrs. Kerr now. Like her little sugar baby is now gone. Uh, but um, overall, I think this was probably one of the best stories inside here by far. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think Excuse it's me. it's probably the 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 most complete from beginning to end. Yeah. And, and why is it that every time we this is our second time where a guy mixes Lovecraft and horny, we get horny craft again for the second time, and that it works brilliantly. You're thinking of Orlick. Uh, no, I'm, the um, uh, which one are you? Passion Surprise, Lovecraft. The story was literally called. Lovecraft. Oh, 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 oh! I thought you were talking about Unreal. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see you. Oh, and I, uh, I don't want to describe. Eh, whatever. A uh, post. Uh, what was it called? Sub. Sub in, in Unreal was good too. Yeah, that's by Orlick. Yeah, Orlick Zarian. Yeah, that's the one I was. Yep. Orlick Bros. Shout out to Orlick. But yeah, no, it's the second time where you mix horniness with Lovecraft. It's brilliant. The psychosexual tension, because yeah. the biggest of flaw. With Lovecraft is the anti-humanness of it. The humans don't matter, right? The, it's it's very cold in, in Lovecraft. Some, uh, somehow whole, people are horny enough to fuck fish men and end up with the Innsmouth look, but but it's not. There's there's no there's no other sexual component. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Just there, there's no there's no emotion. There's no like banter. It's it's very sterile. Right, and, and intentionally mm-hmm. so, because all the protagonists are kind of very stuck up. They're from the city. They're very cold intellectual types. He's perfectly, purposely putting on that mm-hmm. effect. So with the psychosexual element in this, you get the Lovecraft. Here's a little statue. Oh my God, the unknown. I'm going insane, right? But he's. Mm-hmm. Uh, his, but the thing is, his penis is also going insane. He doubles the head. <laughs> the head my up penis here is and the going head down insane. there. <laughs> <laughs> right? The two heads are getting fucked up in this scenario. Uh, the only problem is it wasn't horny enough. Because the only outwardly sexual thing happens to him is the dream. And then he referenced acting a little bit funny in breakfast. But he doesn't. I. The only. This is like a very strong draft 
But my only big critique is I wish that there was a psychosexual element between him and the and Mrs. Kernow. Like maybe maybe he read her wrong. Maybe <laughs> Kernow wasn't even into her. So he starts trying to make moves on her. Like he rubs her knee while they're watching television. He gets more and more Gabe, sexually Gabe, aggressive. Gabe, did you want this to be porn? <laughs> yeah, did you? Why did it go all the way? I, I, yeah, I, you, we don't. I wanted more of the psychosexual element to build up the tension because the, the 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 ending hook liner is him having a hard. He's 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 erect. The barnacles are basically mm-hmm. SCDs. Right, it's very clever. This, he, he I, got I like edged to death. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> you could say he fell off his edge. Uh, mm. No, I yeah, don't know what that means. Like he, if she, well, he if she teased him though, it would be just straight up horn dog. That's the whole time. No, no, because the beginning before it gets into that is like that's your that's your breather. Right. And then no, no, it's not gears. that she teases him; it's that he completely read her wrong in the beginning. Like he, she likes him just like oh, he's like he's like my son or my nephew. He from the very beginning has had this fantasies about her, but it's always a one way fantasy. She so doesn't even tease him; she's just confused and eventually angry. I think you I know. you want okay. a different that uh, you want a yeah. different story. <laughs> well, no, because the, the, because you the want the Mrs. Is- Kernow extended universe. <laughs> I mean, maybe that can happen. <laughs> no, yeah. because, the, because the, the punchline is very, very good. The punchline is you, you see his body being taken out of the body, and you see his hard cock. He's hard, right? The, that's the punchline. But the thing is, there's no psychosexual tension. The only sexual moment... And the thing is, he acts erratic, but he doesn't act horny. There's, it, he wants to be away from Mrs. Coronel the entire time. Well, and because just be he, with the statue. Yeah, well, of course, yeah, because initially He's he was... initially he was pussy yeah. magic. He was initially interested in Mrs. Kernow, but then, like, became obsessed with the statue, and the statue took on, uh, you know, took on all of that. He, he, she, had, she is goon with it, right? <laughs> like, yeah, he's and and it's like he is almost like a personal failure that he never made the actions. Now he has this sort of substitute um, idol. You know that fulfills it for him more easily. So it's like a personal failing on his part that led to it. Which, if it was a longer story, then like yeah, you know, build that up more. But within you know within the tight page count, uh, yeah, I think I think it's goon, gooned up yeah, to a good it's degree. Very, and the thing is, he knows I could do multi-character dialogue. He knows it has to bounce because clearly with the old men, the style of writing completely changes with the old men, right? Because they have distinct mm. voices. These are his old geezers. They're old island geezers. Yeah chilling and hanging out so he i i want to see more of the him flexing that muscle but overall this story was fantastic i really really this story stuck with me i really liked it really good sir very good sir all right we got one more gentleman yeah, one left by uh you know zero h motherfucking p yep Oh, another Lovecraft thing? <laughs> Boo. So played out. <laughs> well, no, actually, this isn't Lovecraft inspired. This is actually Jorge Luis Borges inspired. It, yeah, very Borgesian. Yeah. I, I, I was just memeing because of his last yes. pen name. Yes. <laughs> is that a Lovecraft <laughs> reference? Yikes. You should, you should become like uh, level 10 Clark Ashton Smith or something, <laughs> David, if you ever need a new <laughs> pen name. <laughs> <laughs> multi-class multi-class yeah Smith. multi-class <laughs> ashton smith yeah uh, uh dumb stat howard oh rest, Ooh, rest in peace that's a good one rest in peace dump stat howard <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Immediate, you immediately punch your own ticket <laughs> <It's> the... <laughs> uh um, I don't even know who's next up in order. Or who can? I'll do it. You know, I, I, this to, to do the first summary. This, yeah. this story is, I dare I say, a perfect story. It it, it is leaps and bounds uh, better than his last story we covered. If you for all the old heads of Tookie's Bag, all the people listening on our last Tookie's Mag right now, as you know, <laughs> back in the old days, we used to cover a publishing house known as Passage Press, and um, his story was in there last time. Um, but uh, <clears throat> anyway, back to the story. is uh, The story is called Pipes of Heaven. And the UI design, yet again, it goes it takes a completely different change. Because usually people are like hawking back to the mid-20th century. You got file paperwork, that kind of thing. But this paper, it's not even paper anymore. Technically speaking, this is supposed to be all digital. But anyway, so the story is called Pipes of Heaven by Zero H.P. Lovecraft. And it opens with a, with a very poignant poem to the overall theme of the piece. 
And uh, it is, <clears throat> the pipes of heaven, these are the hollows everywhere. The pipes of men, these are rows of tubes. Tell me about the pipes of heaven. Who is it that blows that 10,000 disputing voices? Who, when of themselves, they stop their talk, has sealed them, and puffs out of them the opinions that they choose for themselves? Zuzi. So he quotes this poem by this Chinaman. And uh, it is basically... The, this, the poem itself is one of those like opening poem lines or opening kind of like references. I forgot what the term is called, blurb. It's not blurb, but the, these quotes people do. So the quote basically tells you the entire story, but not in a negative way, but in a very clever way. Because the whole story it is about our unnamed protagonist, who basically he's horny. He wants to date some girls, but um, he goes onto a dating site. And he finds this very mid girl. I think he says he's a 6 out of 10, I believe. And um, she, he hits her up, and he's very self-conscious. You know, he tries to make corny-ass dad jokes. And uh, he wears a beautiful burgundy sweater. But he's like, oh, no, is burgundy? Because, like, purple is, like, mistru- I saw a stat somewhere that purple is, like, untrustworthy. I should have said dark red. So he's, 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 very, he's very beta. And, uh, and of course, she, she dips on him. She doesn't meet her up at the restaurant at all. So he goes home to goon about it. And, but he finds on his phone, there's pictures of him and her at the restaurant. He's like, how can this be? And he sees, he checks his Lyft account. And he sees that money's been taken away. And he sees even that the, there's, it shows on the map the car has been at her place and his place. And he starts waking up with these dreams and these memories of him and her. The distinct smell of her post-fucked hair. Her wearing baggy sweatpants. Her, him going to her parents' place. The, he feels these distinct sensual and like, on the nerve memories of her despite the fact that he got literally left at the altar at the restaurant so he has this moment of how can this be so he eventually goes digging onto like obscure telegram groups and discord servers until he finds this unknown wise man the the morpheus of the story and uh the morpheus character explains to him there's this phenomenon known as the harugan it's h-r-o-g-e-n i believe I actually can't see on the paper, but yeah. I think it's Hronirian. Uh, Ron- Hronirian. Uh, hold on, where yep. is it? Where- I need to find the term. Yeah. Hronir. So Hronir is this phenomenon, and he describes it in two different ways. The materialistic di- um, point of view on the event, and the holistic view of an event. The materialistic view is that it's a bunch of hackers trying to fuck with you, and basically identity fraud slash money scams. The problem is, they already took the money, at this point, but this the alteration of events is still going on. Like the an, an average hacker doesn't need to do um, to tell you that you went with your girlfriend to like the local barista in order to take your money. But they, they keep on adding to the story, adding to the narrative. And he comes to this beautiful aside about sex bots. It's like funny we have legislation on sex bots. But have you ever seen a sex bot? Everyone talks about sex bots, but you've never seen one, have you? Have you ever attempted to order one? You're either in a backlog, or they give you coupons. You never get your sex bot. The entire trial, he even references a trial, like a made-up trial that happened. It's not even made up. The trial did happen, by the way. This trial of a guy who gave up the secret codes to get uh, bypass the consent meter <laughs> on, an, on a sex bot. And uh, the beautiful moment when the judge explains, well, you see, rape not only affects the victim, the victim but the, on a conceptual level, it affects all women everywhere. Just like terrorism doesn't affect... Gabe really liked this part, by it's the way. It's a great part. It's a fantastic part. It really is a great yes. part. It, it's Because it, 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 it has layers. It, it, the, the motif curls into itself. It's a good... I, I thought it was good. I thought it was good, right? So... Because it, the, the rationale, <laughs> it was, it's, it's it was. very lib brain. He, he knows how to get into the lib brain very well. Because that is the rationale of like libs when they talk about sex bots. It's like, you see, the idea of the sex bot, the rape as a concept, has mimetic social cultural harm. So it's not actually, it doesn't matter if the robot has consciousness or not. It's the very idea of the idea of rape upon this robot that causes the issue. So this guy gets into jail. Gets, you can be Except illegally, that is can, true. Except it is true. Well, like all What's things, true? like the alternative is how does this affect you personally? <laughs> like there are things well, yeah. that are abs- uh, uh, fucking a sex bot is like it's it's obviously not as bad as raping a woman, uh, but it's obviously worse than just masturbating on natural. Just like 
jacking it without porn is less bad than jacking it with porn, right? There are, there are actual consequences to doing any of that. Oh, it's like that Futurama episode with the robots. What? Sex bots. The Futurama episode. You remember the Futurama episode where the sex box come in and the birth rate crashes? Oh, I didn't. I think I, I saw didn't this remember one. that one. No. Yeah. So <laughs> it's up to me. I didn't remember there was. A, I didn't remember there was a TFR uh, Futurama episode. <laughs> <sighs> no, no. I'm the pulp culture referencing one in this cast now. But no, it's it's great. The reason why it's great is because well. I agree with you, except in this sense, it's not, they don't care about social cohesion. It's only due to like a partisan thing. Like, uh, it's, it's to have the mimetic fragility because women have a monopoly on sex, right? So this is a rad femme sure. argument, uh, right? So it, it's not actually about so stable, so civil, it's not a civilizational concern. It's a monopoly concern, right? It's, it's, uh, it's uh, basically it's like the diamond um, mafia in South Africa not wanting artificially crafted diamonds because they lose a monopoly on diamond crafting. Wasn't this like two paragraphs? The sex pot, like <laughs> the story you gave, really going in detail. Well, no, it's this part. It's, it's, it's a big thing, and it actually it, it just it beautifully it expands yeah. upon the theme of alternate realities and the fact that the technological. He even says the technological is more real. The derealization, uh, like a. He says something along the lines, yeah. Uh, here's, a, here's a good quote, actually, I'll buy it. Heronian derealization is possible because our lives have bifurcated into a technologically mediated subjectivity and a purely immediate, Im- imminent subjectivity. The former world is delimited only by gossip, and we soar into the heights of all that is possible. The latter is delimited by physical locality, and it makes us feel earthbound, limited to what is in front of us. The frontiers of mediated life are never clear-cut. Beyond its internal configuration, it is caught up in a system of references to other mediations. It is a node within a network. Who among us, in some contemplative twilight hour, has not suspected that the fixtures of his online life lack any physical counterpart? So what he's saying here is that basically being chronically online is more... You touch grass in reality, you feel like you're touching grass more when you're chronically online than when you're actually offline. And the realities of what you're around are actually more defined what is online, what is more meta, what is constructed than what is in front and tactile in front of you. That's what the sex bot thing is actually kind of a big deal thematically, is that the way you actually interact, the ideas of sex, the ideas of actual legality, everything within this world is completely controlled basically through pure mimetic manifestation, basically. Are you also? Am I understanding it right that uh, essentially with the the frontier, your virtual presence essentially, or you've been like bifurcated so that your virtual presence basically is like almost divorced from you. You've like split it into like two worms essentially. And the, well, in this guy's case, he's experienced this derealization. Total. And now yeah. he is, but he's his consciousness that he's aware of is trapped in the physical plane. He's almost like lost awareness, and then, and then, and then the debate is like, okay, so there's all these social media posts of you online. So, like, is it blackmail, or is it like some sort of thing, self-aware thing, or is it something? What, what's the alternative non-materialist description? The holistic description. It's like a hyperstition. It's, like it's it's it's, yeah. it's it's landing in hyperstition, basically. It becomes real. Yeah. Like, yeah. I guess I I don't know if I got the like the grass the grass metaphor you made but th- that that was my understanding of no, it no because the things that are online feel more real like he sees these pictures of him and it's purely on instagram he has no physical reality he knows the fact that he was- i don't think he remembers them though like he doesn't have any real memory no, he- of those and that's why he's shocked no, because he's like whoa there's a picture of me at a cafe but he starts remember he starts remember he has dreams he met- he eventually seeing her in slacks and yoga pants in his mind he wakes mm. up he smells her hair like uh, he he remembers what she feels like in bed. He starts having these he, he mimetically sponged. It's it's hyperstition shamanism right here. Uh, it starts mimetically manifesting basically, and uh, that's why I said it becomes the online world becomes more real than touching grass. Because in, in real life, when he touched grass, he ended up being left on the altar. He got cucked basically. He's left in his bowl of noodles and no girl to share it with. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but he, it, it almost seems like. You know, we're talking about. I mean, to to read to read into this just a little bit, because uh, it's something that 
I mean, I, I guess I guess we should maybe we, we could talk about the the story on its own merits, but then we can also talk about the story in terms of the larger uh, ZHP posting ecosystem. You know, he he does say things occasionally about the nature of um, the nature of media, right, and the effects on individuals in that in media, but just that you know this could be you know trying to get at something <clears throat> where the compartmentalization of an online life and a physical life uh becomes uh becomes not not mere not mere derealization but like total um uh dissociation you see what i mean Right. Where, where the you, the you in your real life and the you that is that exists on the internet, are are so fundamentally uh, split that they don't understand each other and maybe don't you know don't even share the same memories. They have vague associations, um, and I mean, in in a way, you know, you can you can see that sort of you could see that sort of thing happen. You can especially see how that sort of thing could happen to someone who, you know, isn't a, uh, (laughs) in, in your words, Gabe, I would never say this micro (laughs) niche e-celeb, but actually has a following of some importance. Right. I think zero HP has to mid, actually, no, he's like probably the top, top micro niche e-celeb. Yeah, I know. I I know. I was talking about us. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yo, yo, yo. Listen, I like to say we're we're we are the e celebs e celeb. We are not n- well known outside. We're but we're also we're like, we're like we're also not that though. I just want to be we, clear. We don't, no, we're like the, we're like the pixies, like the Velvet Underground, right? Everyone, n- no one bought the records, but everyone who did buy a record started a band. Didn't they say about Velvet Underground? Yeah, except they're both of them are legendary. I have both of their al- I both have both of their discographies. So. And we have 300 subscribers. Okay. Oh, I'm, not getting, I'm, I'm gonna not die. Getting I'm gonna die this. before I explain this yeah. to you. Gabe. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but you have the Hronir, and unfortunately, like I know that this is from Borges, but I have not. I have. I am unread in Borges, and I haven't read. You never read Borges. Yeah, and I haven't read the the story that it comes from. Uh, which is apparently uh, Tion Ukbar Orbis Tertius. So, uh, excuse me. Actually, it's Talon. Thank you very much. Uh, sure, um, but I I don't. Uh, so I don't. I don't know the origin of the Hronir in in his work to apply it to this. But I'm, I'm sure this is. I'm, I'm sure that ZHP is doing his own take on it. Um, well, it's not. It's not just Borges. It's also this is just actually straight up NRX fiction because he he basically straight up references Moldbug at one point, right? With the idea of power going to the scientists, but the problem and like the idea of the modern scientific esp- epistemological consensus, the idea of scientific method is fundamentally based on citation. But you see, you see the idea of like how everything is very loose. Like the idea of you don't have any shared memories with, that scales. The idea of even the systems of reality, because how we define reality is based on uh, scientific method. Well, using this this technology, using this phenomenon, this event, right, this mass technological psychosis, this illusion, basically, our mm-hmm. you can have millions of citations of papers confirming one thing, and ex- and the exact same amount of citations confirming another. It's like mass. Uh, I think the AI calls it what cannibalism. It's not cannibalism. It's oh, when the AI it Sahara Desert it, within this story. Yeah, it's Sierra. It Sahara. Yeah, but there's this event. Yeah. where the problem is with AI generated stuff is that eventually they learn their learning modules it itself feeds on themselves eventually so they learn all the shit they it basically just turns into sludge because the internet starts getting filled with AI generated stuff and their learning modules end up feeding they're on e- they're itself. eating they're eating only generated things so the LLM is the uh, yeah the LLM is ultimately a uh, a decelerant because it starts it starts feeding on itself and hallucinations will only compound Right. Yeah, and the keyword being hallucinations. 
So it's not only on an individual level, it's on a scale on the entire, once you, it, it starts with like a little joke about sex and a joke of this, about this one little loser guy wanting to get with this girl. But in reality, the, it's like, uh, this story is a keyhole into this world. And the keyhole limits it. When you, when you really think about it, it's just terrifying, really. The entire story basically is that the entire concept of reality is completely and utterly shattered. Uh, right, but because it's under the frame of this little keyhole, this one little loser guy, it frames it in a be- it's beautifully compacted and constructed and restrained. The borders on the story are de- deliciously confined, and um, and, and the ending even adds that con- confination. But um, yeah, so the idea of the because it, it's just basically the ideas of Nick Land's hyperstition, the cathedral, obviously, mm-hmm. and Borges. So this is generally just authentic NRX sci-fi, which is kind of pretty cool, to be honest. And uh, because he even talks about like, in many ways, scientific literature has always suffered from this problem. But as science was increasingly given authority in the 20th century, power inevitably corrupts knowledge. Like that's basically, Yarvin brings that up every like third podcast when he's not talking about Hitler lives, basically. Oh, there was one other one I wanted to read. Um, Outside the porn bot, the, the, the black woman. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> this one really stuck out to me i interviewed a, a woman named shalamba a black lesbian with cerebral palsy uh who is nevertheless proficient at coding in python she interviewed remotely through zoom for a position at, as a senior software developer at google but she did not get the job despite her overwhelming qualifications at sub- subsequent interviews at other companies she found that the recruiters the hiring managers and the interviewers all seemed to resemble her more and more as time went on in her life as a remote worker, all of her colleagues and all of her superiors appeared to be black lesbians with cerebral palsy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> their faces increasingly came to resemble her own face, but despite these superficial commonalities, she was unable to establish a rapport with anyone beyond the strictly professional. As her coworkers converged into being simulations of herself, her job became an increasingly surreal simulation of software development. Uh, I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just, uh, uh, yeah, an unnerving thing to read, but also very relatable as like a remote worker and, and the way people kind of mimic themselves. I don't know, this idea of yourself reproducing and, and you're like dealing with, with versions of yourself. I, I don't know. I feel like this is, I feel like there was like, if anything, there was like idea overload in this. Cause like, I feel like there's so many, <laughs> so many ways I could take talking about it. But I, I like it. I like the way it is. I'm not asking it to be cut in the least. It, um, yeah. No, because it all ties in together. Like this is basically what me and Cap talked about with the AI feeding on its own generated content. This is just that. It's, this is the paperclip maximizer, but with black lesbians, basically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, or the, another good aspect is he talks about a guy who has brain surgery, and uh, the, the, that one part of the oh, brain yeah. is affected because it's connected to the internet. So you literally have, you basically have, cart, what, what was it, Cartes, Cartesian dualism, I think? Like literally one part of the brain is literally a ghost of the machine, and the other brain is literally, so he, he's not, he's barely affected, because it's literally only that one microchip part of the brain that's having these crazy dreams, and the other part, it's just looking complete, befuddled and confused, even more than general people with this issue. Like, because uh, uh, Zero HP likes his side tangents to talk about concepts and ideas, if, if both of you remember the story he did in Patrick's Prize, he also talks about the idea of fake realities in that one, and he goes on a little side tangent, but that one felt very incongruent. It felt too much the side hook broke away from the main piece. Mm-hmm. This hook curls right back. It's nothing but curls. This entire story structure curls. It's literally like a typhoon or like a, like a curly fry, basically. It just curls into itself. Food metaphor. <laughs> no, I, I didn't <laughs> say, uh, no. A, 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 it could be like a fry is just another term for something that's coiled, right? Like like mm, like, yeah, like a so like true. a fry fried wire, right? So, well, yeah, that black woman's hair. <laughs> the um, yeah, great story, well done. Um, we're at like two hours and something. Any any other well, ones on this I one? I think or? Th- there's also maybe a king and yellow reference because everyone's thinking about yellow walls. Hmm. Yes, yeah, there is. Or so it might be a reference to the backgrounds for the zoomers. For just you know, just for the zoomies, you know. Yeah, but what is, what's the word they have for it? Spaces. The, um... <laughs> no, 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 liminal spaces. Liminal. That's liminal spaces, yes. Thank you. Yeah. My heck, in liminal space. Oh, my brain is separated. Oh I'm no, I can't space. handle vacant offices. 
the the zoomer mind cannot comprehend can i handle carpeted floors yeah and uh, yeah but that uh Okay. No, I was about to say the ending is great, by the way, because so this is this Mor- Morpheus character who's giving all this like lore dumping on this protagonist. The protagonist, he's like, so, uh, the he's like, sorry, what's that? You're asking how any of this helps you about the girl you're dating on the internet, but not in real life. <laughs> so the this well, guy, the answer the lore- is I can I can help you find her. The question is, <laughs> do you still want to meet her? <laughs> Yeah, assuming like I I I feel like he's a little catty about this. He's like, I just told you your entire reality is a lie, and everyone else's reality is a lie, and you're just. He's like, you know what? I don't care. I, I I'm I'm too horny to give a shit right now. <laughs> like this version of Neo is just like, I just want to fuck the girl with the rabbit tattoo. I don't care about any of these pills, man. <laughs> um, it, the thing is, it's actually a better version of uh, this. Is what Baldriard would have preferred. Um, uh, of the Matrix to be. This is actually what a, a 135 Anglo would have made the Matrix to be. Because the Matrix is too... Baldur's critique of the Matrix was that basically it's a, it's a film the Matrix would produce. Because it's too... The, the delineation between reality and the unreal or the digital is too easily identifiable to both the protagonist and the viewer. While something like this, there, there is, the delineation line is not visible, basically. We have no idea how when this started. We know how far it goes. All we know is that any frame of reference point is fundamentally faulty. He says even physical media at this point, physical copies, he references Thomas Brown's uh, book, The Garden of Cyrus, which is, it talks about straight lines. You know, ZHP, another favorite part of his writing style, he loves geometry. So the, the entire book on the Thomas Brown's, it's an ancient text on, I think, um, geometry or like uh, mysticism. And it's, it talks about these, this weird grid that no matter how you look at it, you always see straight lines. It's, you always see the beautiful Apollonian straight lines. So he says at this point, even physical copy, physical media is warping at this point because the people who generate it, stuff like that. So any frame of reference of reality is completely and utterly, at this point, you as a human being must assume that everything is artificially constructed. And so it's actually, a, it takes the Matrix idea and actually takes it to its full potentiality as a concept. In other words, this was a really great story. <laughs> yeah, absolute banger. All righty. So we've gone on quite quite a while, gentlemen. I think we, I think we can call it there. Well done, uh, well done, Biz Archives guys. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we got to end on a neo epistolary uh, story like this. So it's, it was really, really good. I fucking. I, <laughs> I mean, the you. whole, the whole thing was epistolary. Yeah, right? yeah I mean, it's, it's written on pages. <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, so remember be, neo, uh, neo epistolary is with digital, like emails and stuff like this. So technically, since this involves like text messages and like Discord calls, technically this is neo epistolary. This is this is how everything that happened. This is how any crime committed on the internet is also wire fraud. This is that, and and also <laughs> interstate commerce. This is that logic. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, the unknown, I'm going insane. Right? But he's his but the thing is his penis is also going insane. He doubled the heads.